What if Naruto and Sasuke were a new god part 2 team 7, DXD by Razufi. Now remember Naruto-kun, it's okay to not get it first try. Naruto nodded his head idly, hands placed atop his knees and body completely still. His breathing evened out almost instantaneously, natural chakra making its way through his pores and settling in his body. An aura of serenity surrounded the teen as he called upon the natural chakra in the world, his entire body stilled nearly resembling a statue as he allowed the energy to circulate through his body. Having mastered the art of senjutsu to a degree that was unheard of even in his own home, it was always such a rush. Naruto's senses spread throughout the entirety of the Kyoto and even beyond as his chakra flowed in synergy with the natural energy of this world. All was normal for the first few minutes before he felt something, grip his very being. Eyebrows furrowing for the briefest moments Naruto reached out with his chakra, trying to grasp the energy that he could feel. This was the same signature he had sensed during his fight with Amaterasu. It was, it was ancient, similar to when Kagaya had taken over Madara's body. What is this? Who is this? Who are you, child? You do not belong here. Naruto's eyes snapped open revealing his toad-like pupils as a distinct unknown feminine voice resounded through his mind. He surveyed the room multiple times, body tense and chakra practically shrieking at the foreign voice and feeling he was receiving. When he realized there was no threat in his immediate vicinity he turned inward. Karama? There is no one. We heard the voice as well. Ah. So this was going to be an external issue wasn't it? Any guesses? Naruto asked with an uncharacteristically hardened edge. The Kyubi snorted briefly, as if almost derisive. Judging by the amount of natural energy this being was capable of producing, it can only be that of divinity. This is going to be an issue. He replied back. Kurama offered the teen nothing in response but knew Naruto would understand. They had more issues at hand to deal with than some unknown goddess throwing a tantrum. It is only an issue if you let it become one, Naruto-kun. Matabi replied calmly. We have more things to worry about. Kurama harshly cut in. Nay, Kurama-kun. Don't be so mean. Bite me. Stop it. Both of you. Naruto spoke up, eyes rolling with a smile. Whatever or whoever it is can gladly come here to solve the problem we may or may not have. The two biju did not respond nor did they trade barbs with one another. Now, let's focus. The blonde stated, happy to have prevented Matabi and Kurama's bickering, I still need to master Banbutsu Sozo. Naruto raised his hands from his knees before placing them shoulder length apart. Golden chakra seeped through his hands as he gathered his chakra to perform said jutsu. Several minutes passed by in silence and Naruto was becoming increasingly frustrated. Having the innate ability to understand chakra to its being core was both a blessing and a curse. It allowed him to understand the flow of chakra, its uses, and everything from application to theory. What it didn't teach was something that was more difficult explaining than doing. Example. Naruto knew he could use Jintan, but he didn't know any jutsu surrounding the particle style. All he did know was that he was able to harness the affinities that made up Jintan and was able to easily merge them together to create said release. Which led him to the pinnacle of what should be ninjutsu. Bambutsu no Sozo. He knew he could do it but knowing and doing were separate entities. Is this how Sasuke felt when trying to master his Rinnegan? This was so annoying. The worst part is he knew what to do but couldn't do it. How the fuck is that even possible? You're thinking too hard about it, Naruto. Kakuo softly spoke. What is Bambutsu no Sozo? Slightly confused, Naruto responded with furrowed brows. The ability to breathe life into something from nothing using yin ying release. Correct child. The gentle giant responded. Then what is it that you're doing wrong? Naruto's face shifted in confusion as he stared at his hands, golden chakra twisting and turning in his hands. What was he doing wrong? He didn't know. That was the issue here. Upon sensing his growing frustration, Kakuo spoke again. Calm down Naruto. Perhaps we should use something practical instead. You know how to use Mokotan yes? Naruto's golden hands touched together and from his actions, a tree slowly sprouted from the ground. Good. Now make it do something. Naruto blinked at the request before tilting his head. He stared at the tree for a moment before mentally commanding the tree to spiral into the sky, twisting and turning as it did. Good, good. Now create something with it. Kakuo encouraged with a smile. Uh. Like what? Whatever you wish child, you can make a wooden dragon or even a golem like that one Senju fancied. Furrowing his eyebrows, Naruto states at the wooden construct before shifting his hands into a random hand seal. The giant tree twisted several times as the floor erupted, several other large trees and wood coalescing together to create something from his imagination. After a few seconds of silence Naruto opened his eyes with a smile, 
pleased that he had created a miniature version of Kakuo. You flatter me, child. Kakuo praised softly, causing a grin to appear on Naruto's face. Now all you need to do is breathe life into it. Naruto stared at the wooden construct for a few seconds before his eyes widened in realization. Wait it was that easy? No way. The pseudo Jubi Jinchuriki clapped his hands together as he gathered yin and yang chakra. Closing his eyes the boy urged his chakra to mesh together through his Mokotan creation. When he opened his eyes, the wooden construct had moved from its previous position, it now stood directly in front of Naruto, almost mimicking the Gobi's mannerisms. Congratulations Naruto. Kakuo responded easily. It was that simple? Naruto questioned with a tilted head, right hand coming to rest upon the giant head of the wooden Gobi. The wooden creature lowered its head, moving with its own will as it allowed the teen to pat its head. Simple as watering it down. Kurama snorted quietly. The application is what makes it difficult. Bambutsu no Sozo uses the basic understandings of yin yin chakra and takes it to an abnormal degree. Giving an entity its own consciousness is something that few could ever dream to accomplish. Naruto idly patted the wooden gobi before responding with a single eyebrow raised. Does it not create life? That is a misunderstanding. Kurama responded without explaining. It matters not though. Bambutsu no Sozo is not something that can just be replicated. Your understanding of chakra is the only reason why you're able to replicate it in the first place. But Super Gramps created all of you. You're basically alive. Naruto commented with a lazy shrug. You are simplifying it heavily, Naruto-kun. Matabi responded patiently. We are only constructs of chakra that have been given sentience. We are not alive like you are. Naruto pursed his lips for a moment before replying. That sounds demeaning. Shaking his head, he continued. You all have feelings and are capable of rational thought. Just because you don't have to eat or sleep or anything like that doesn't make you any less alive than me. You are far too sweet Naruto-kun. Thank you. We all appreciate your words even if some of us refuse to say so. Matabi responded gently with a teasing tone to her voice. She means you Kurama. Naruto replied with a smirk. Shut up, you annoying little mongrel. Kurama snapped angrily. Love you too buddy. The blonde teen continued to indulge the wooden creation for a few moments before creating a single hand seal. The construct slowly froze before shifting and changing. The trees that he had created slowly lowering back into the ground, disappearing from sight. Papa! Naruto's chest heaved as he heard Yasaka's daughter enter the room. His heart. Ak. Papa? Him? Turning on his heel the teen spotted the small Kayubi making her way towards him with a large grin on her face. Papa! She cried happily, tails waving erratically. Ak. Critical damage. Abort. 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 Before Naruto could escape his demise the tiny Kayubi launched herself into his arms, preventing the teen from escaping. Kuno-chan. How many times do I have to tell you that I'm not your father? He responded in an exasperated tone, blood staining his cheeks. The little Kayubi shifted her position in Naruto's arms, amber orbs staring up at the teen with adoration. Oh Kami, she was too cute. Ak, save me, but your papa, she replied simply with a tilted head. The little Kayubi placed her arms around the shinobi's neck before nuzzling her face into his neck. Papa. Naruto would have fainted on the spot had it not been for the fact that he could potentially hurt Kuno with his actions. Face practically flaming, the teen responded. Yasaka and I aren't even together Kuno-chan. You can't just go around calling me that. How would your mother feel? Though his words said one thing, his actions proved the exact opposite. His right hand came up to support the girl as his left hand rested on her back, gently caressing the girl as a father would. NNMH. Don't care. She replied happily, enjoying the comforting feeling of Naruto and his chakra. Papa, my papa. You do realize that you're fucked, yes? Kurama states unhelpfully. Shut up. There was several seconds of silence as Naruto tried desperately to control the raging blush on his face. Yusaka's daughter was far too bold. He and Yusaka weren't even romantically involved. They were just friends. Yes, the woman incredibly beautiful and he enjoyed being around her but... Ho, playing daddy now, Naruto-kun? Naruto's heart practically leapt out of his chest as Yusaka's voice resounded from the entrance of his room. Shifting carefully to avoid disturbing the woman's daughter, he spotted the woman blocking the only exit to the room. Upon her face was a beautiful smile that reeked of mischievousness, the kind of smile he used to have when doing pranks around Konoha. It's almost like she planned this. Air, it's a uh, not what it looks like, he questioned more so than defended. The Kayubi shifted her weight on one leg, which was practically fucking sinful, and positioned one of her arms beneath her giant breasts. An amused expression graced her face as she spoke. 
It looks like you're applying for the role of Kunu's father. Naruto opened his mouth to deny the woman's words but was cut off from speaking. She's never had the love of a father. You deny her that, Naruto-kun? This was a setup. A a ruse, he was being manipulated. And no, of course not. I'd nev, he was cut off once more as Yasaka responded with a sly smile. Good, take good care of my daughter. There was heavy emphasis on those words. Do a good enough job and perhaps you can become her real father, hum? Without another word the gorgeous yokai exited the room with a sway to her hips. Naruto wasn't ashamed to admit he had been staring directly at her ass. Denying it would make him a liar and he was many things, but a liar wasn't one of them. Have you seen those hips? No shot, he had already lost. You are fucking whipped. Shut up Kurama. Sakura's eyes roamed along the document she was reading before hearing a gentle knock on her door. The pink-haired teen closed the document before slowly rising from her seat and heading to the entrance of her room. Upon opening her door she was surprised to see the leader of the yokai faction. Normally Yusaka would send a servant to retrieve her if she wished to speak. This was new. Yusaka-sama. Sakura greeted with a minor bow. Is there something I can do for you? The blonde Kayubi offered the girl a small smile before raising a hand. No formalities Sakura. Is it okay if I come in? The pinkette furrowed her eyebrows for a moment before opening the door wider and allowing the woman into her new home. Would you like some tea? Yusaka stepped through the entrance with practiced ease and grace as she replied. Tea would be nice, thank you. The medic said nothing and went to accomplish her task as Yusaka took a seat on the couch in the living room. Several minutes of silence passed before Sakura made her way into the living room carrying a tray with multiple snacks and two cups of freshly brewed tea. Upon setting the tray down, Sakura took a seat in the recliner opposite to the couch and offered a smile to Yusaka. So, what brings you here Yusaka? The yokai leader said nothing at first, choosing to savor the delicious tea of the medic. She was quiet for a few more moments before focusing upon Sakura. Tell me. She began slowly, a calculative expression on her face. Has Naruto ever been intimate with another woman? Sakura, having been ready to take a sip of her tea, froze at the question. She was silent for nearly an entire minute before clearing her throat quietly. Setting the cup back on the tray she returned Yusaka's stare with a curious one. Uh. Well, not to be rude but why are you asking me this? The Kayubi smiled slyly as she held her cup of tea. Humor me, hum? The medic continued to stare at the woman for a moment before shrugging her shoulders and taking a sip of her tea. To my knowledge. No but there was a point in time where he disappeared from the village on a training trip for three years with his sensei, who at the time was renowned for being a massive pervert. The Kayubi chuckled at the statement before taking a sip of her tea. She held the cup just in front of her mouth hiding the smile on her face. He is not incredibly subtle with his gaze. Sakura blinked at the statement before glancing towards the tray on the table. Subtlety isn't Naruto's MO it never has been though, to be fair. Returning her gaze on the blonde woman, she continued. I'm not an expert on the subject considering I chased after a childhood crush for several years, risking even my life and career just to get said man to notice me. I'd suggest that you be the one to make the first move. Naruto certainly won't be the one to do it. Yusaka chuckled dryly at the woman's advice. I figured that to be the case, he is very dense. A snort was Sakura's response. You'd have to hit him over the head with a brick that said, please fuck me, on it to get him to understand. Had Yusaka taken a sip of her tea she would have most certainly spit it out at the girl's comment. Instead, she settled for an amused snort. I fear that even that would not be enough. Sakura shrugged her shoulders before placing her cup of tea on the tray. He's changed a lot. Dense and sometimes childish, but he knows what he wants. You just have to push him. He didn't have parents growing up and getting him to understand basic social cues was a job in itself. Trust me, you're better off just swinging for it. I doubt you'll miss. He seems really infatuated with you. Yusaka's eyes slowly trailed away from the teen before settling on the tray of snacks and tea. She reached for one of the snacks on the tray, idly recalling the statement Sakura had thrown out when speaking about Naruto. Ahem. And what's this about you risking your life and career? Yusaka asked while munching on her pastry. Sakura's eyes widened for a moment as pink dashed her cheeks. She was silent for a moment before clearing her throat. Well, that's a... Ahem. That's a story for another time. The Kayubi smirked as she replied. Era era, there's a story there. Sakura's left eye twitched as her blush deepened. It isn't that deep. Doesn't sound like it. The Kayubi responded while shifting her head side to side. The pinkette was silent for several moments as she stewed in her embarrassment regarding her actions due to her crush, love, obsession with Sasuke. She had rationalized these feelings long ago and questioned her decisions after the war had ended. After all, she had a lot of time to think when the jutsu failed to bring back humanity. 
Sakura had come to hate and love herself during those six grueling months. Everything she had ever done in her life that led her to facing down Kagaya with the rest of Team 7. Her actions in the academy when she was a child. Her actions when she was a kunoichi for Konoha. Her decisions being a kunoichi, her feelings, everything. She had grown to hate herself. Looking back on all her choices, knowing that she accomplished very little and done very little had triggered some sort of epiphany. Her thoughts got prohibitively darker and darker when surrounding Sasuke and the feelings and actions she had made. She did have a crush on Sasuke, but she had fantasized from the very beginning about what life could be like with the cool kid. She was just a child, who could really blame her? The fault fell on her when she refused to correct these actions and solve these issues. Yes, Kakashi could have curbed such thoughts but it also wasn't his job to fully change her thoughts on life and what it meant to be a kunoichi. Kakashi could have beaten her to an inch of her life every single day for a year all while stating that Sasuke would never love her and she'd still have believed him to be lying. She had been delusional during her time as a genin and seeing all those deaths when pain invaded Konoha had broke something in her. A medic knew that not every person could be saved. Tsunade certainly knew that. Hell, even Ino knew that. It just seemed that she herself was incapable of learning these important lessons. Deaths by the thousands only followed during the Fourth Shinobi War and she had learned the true futility of human life and what it meant to be a shinobi. While Sasuke and Naruto had understood that sentiment they both interpreted it differently. A shinobi is one who endures. Sakura had rarely endured hardships and actively chose to downplay the life of a shinobi. She was incredibly lucky that she hadn't died early on and even more lucky that she was still alive. It took time to accept this and even more to forgive herself. Her change had been subtle but not completely hidden. Kakashi and Sasuke took notice almost immediately. Naruto? EHH? Not so much but she doubted that would change. She was no longer that delusional child that she was in the elemental nations. Yes, she was still incredibly aggressive and forward but delusional? Never again. Life had quite literally slapped the shit out of her. And she was humbled for it. Sakura sighed quietly before slowly rising to her feet, garnering a raised eyebrow from Yusaka. She ignored the woman's question and made her way to her liquor cabinet. Like sensei-like student. The pinkette pulled out a large bottle of alcohol before making her way back to Yusaka. Taking her seat back in the recliner, Sakura spun the cap off the liquor before placing the ceramic to her lips. Yusaka watched on in muted shock as the girl swallowed mouthful after mouthful of the liquor. Oh my. Sakura finally lowered the bottle revealing that she had drank half of the entire bottle. A long and heavy exhale left her body followed by an unobnoxiously loud belch. Where do I even start? She commented more so to herself than anything. Twirling the bottle in her hands as she thought for where to start, Sakura burped quietly. Well, let's see. It probably started when people made fun of my forehead. Cuss it's kinda like big, ya yeah, no. Sakura gestured with the bottle towards Yusaka who possessed raised eyebrows. And I didn't have any friends when I was younger. Cuss of my big forehead. Apparently I blinded the other kids, or something. Anyway, whatever. Not even that important. I made a friend though in Naruto but like, when we were younger my mom and dad told me to stay away from him cuz apparently he was a demon or whatever and like, I didn't really know what they were talking about but I went along with it anyway. So, we were friends but not really. The pinkette exhaled heavily before placing the ceramic bottle against her lips and downing even more of the alcohol. A frown marred Yusaka's face and just as she was about to speak, Sakura removed the now empty bottle from her lips. She released another impressive belch before throwing the bottle behind her, ignoring the way it shattered against the wooden floor. Yeah so. We weren't really friends and like I hated him. I met this girl named Ino and she became my best friend and rival and like rival is a loose term because we were absolutely shitty kunoichi. Like, dieting and all this other dumb shit. Not important but like, kinda important or whatever. Another burp. And that's where I met Sasuke. Ah, he was so cool and dreamy and all this other childish shit that I thought about when I was a kid. Anyway, I loved him or something and like, his whole entire family was murdered by his brother but like, I'm 12 years old and I don't even know what that means. I thought he was just cool and all that. Anyway, later on I almost get killed several times during missions, I pretty much do nothing on missions and Sasuke and Naruto have to bail me out all the time. They've always been strong or whatever. Another obnoxious belch releasing from the rather petite woman. She proceeded to wipe her mouth while shaking her head, continuing to ramble. Fast forward like a couple months or whatever and like, our village hosted this tournament where we fight other shinobi for the chance to receive promotions and become higher ranks. But like, you can die and it's supposed to be about strength and all that or whatever. I didn't really understand it. I almost died about 13 times. 
but that's not really important because it was around that time that Sasuke got bit on the neck by a rogue shinobi from our village and it gave him a lot of power and kinda made him evil and stuff. So there I was, about to fight Ino. Sakura. Please stop. Yusaka interrupted with furrowed eyebrows. I think it's best if you rest. The pinkette tilted her head while staring into Yusaka's eyes. She was quiet for a moment as her heavily flushed face sparkled. You're really pretty. An amused smile formed on the yokai's face. Thank you. I can see why Naruto wants to fuck you. Yusaka's expression went flat. And that's enough out of you. Off to bed you go. The yokai began to aid the pinkette to her feet before guiding her to the couch to lay down. After properly laying the drunken girl down, Yusaka spoke with a raised eyebrow. I had a mission for you today but, it can wait. And Sakura was snoring. Okay. Cool. Rolling her eyes, Yusaka exited the room while rubbing her temples. What in the hell just happened? Sasuke felt the stares aimed at his back but ignored them. Why? Because if he ignored them for long enough then they'd eventually disappear. That or he'd have to kill said individuals who were staring. It was a toss-up really, 50-50. Sadly, it was not meant to be. NYA. So what's Kyoto like Sasuke? Kuroka asked while saddling up beside the ebony-haired teen. Ignore it. Just keep walking. You can't ignore me, Sasuke-kun. Can and will. Silence reigned supreme for all of 30 seconds before Kuroka's fingers traveled to a destination that Sasuke didn't authorize. No one could blame him for karate chopping Kuroka in her neck, effectively knocking her out, though he wasn't entirely heartless as her unconscious body was easily hefted onto his back. An incredibly smooth and seamless transition that had the remaining members of Team Valley in shock. Though to be fair, it shouldn't have been that surprising. The guy practically one-shot Valley, and them. Cold-hearted powerful bastard. I think she's good for you. Kakashi offhandedly commented, nose buried in his new hentai manga. I think you should mind your business. Sasuke snapped back. Ma, Sasuke. No need to be so rude. The Jonin replied amusedly. Fuck off. The Uchiha replied placidly. Era. E excuse me. The gentle voice of Lefei piped up beside Sasuke, grabbing his attention almost immediately. When the Uchiha's eyes landed on her it took every ounce of her effort to not cringe away. W will Kuroka-san be okay? The Rinnegan wielder stared at the petite girl for several seconds before turning his head ahead from her. Yes. He said nothing else and that was certainly the best outcome for Lefei who didn't mind having as little interaction with the teen as possible. Did you have to knock her out though? Biku piped out from behind the group. Do you wish to be permanently silenced? Sasuke replied back just as easily. When silence greeted his question, Sasuke nodded his head. That's what I thought. Shut up. Only a few more minutes and he'd be able to escape from these idiots, but then he'd have to deal with Naruto. Glancing back at the annoying group, Sasuke pondered his options. Smoking hot cat girl or loud optimistic blonde teen? Was there even an option? Good luck Kakashi. Sasuke immediately disappeared in a burst of speed. The Janin glanced at Sasuke's previous spot for a moment before sweeping his gaze to the remaining members of Valley's former team. Why? He had even taken the kitty. Hmm. Perhaps he was already smitten with her. That or he wanted to avoid Naruto's questions. Definitely the latter over the former. Fine. He'd take the bullet and report to Yusaka. Sasuke owed him though and he'd be sure to cash that one in. Sasuke touched down in front of his new home, idly shifting Kuroka's weight atop his back. NYA. Why'd you have to hit me so hard? Kuroka groaned out pitifully, rubbing the back of her neck. The ebony-haired teen rolled his eyes before placing his hand atop the knob of his new home. He stopped for a brief second as he sensed a familiar presence nearing his position. Ah. Sasuke. The Uchiha blinked at the woman's voice before slowly turning his attention towards his old teammate. His nose detected the distinct stench of alcohol as he took in her slightly haggard appearance. Sakura? His eyes roamed along her body and he ignored the way that Kuroka shifted atop his back, curiosity burning in her golden orbs. Are you? Okay? The pinkette tilted her head as her emerald orbs strayed towards the yokai on Sasuke's back. She stared for several seconds before a sad smile formed on her face. Ah. Sakura feigned confidence she didn't truly feel. I have. Had far too much to drink. She rubbed her eyes for a moment before sniffing quietly. Where are my manners? I'm Sakura. I used to be Sasuke's teammate. Who are you? Kuroka stared at the pink-haired girl, sensing the incredulous amount of chakra resting in the girl's forehead. Whatever that gem or tattoo was, it was storing a mountain's worth of chakra inside of it. And considering the girl's physique, this girl was a fighter and even though she was clearly inebriated, the hairs on the back of Kuroka's neck stood at attention. 
twin tails swaying back and forth, Kuroka offered the girl a sly smile. I am Kuroka. It is nice to meet a friend of Sasuke Kun's, NYA. Recognition dawned on Sakura's eyes for a moment as she heard the girl's name. Ah. The rogue devil yokai. She trailed off as a lazy smile bloomed on her face. Welcome to Kyoto. I hope you enjoy your stay. Yusaka sama will want to see you eventually. There was an uncomfortable feeling in the air. Kuroka couldn't quite pinpoint the reasoning but it definitely dealt with Sakura and Sasuke, or perhaps Sakura and herself. Did the girl have feelings for him? Was she being viewed as an obstacle? Or perhaps maybe Sakura just didn't like her? Is there something you needed, Sakura? Sasuke commented in a softer tone than Kuroka would have expected from the teen. Sakura's glossy eyes shifted from the yokai to the Uchiha as she briefly swayed on her feet, she was silent for a scant few moments before smiling. I wanted to talk to you, but it can wait, she tried, and failed, to hide the quiet burp that escaped her lips. Have a, have a good night. Without another word the pinkette sashayed away with a lazy gait. Sasuke watched his former teammate walk away with furrowed brows before glancing back to his home. That was, odd, NYA, Kuroka summed up perfectly. The Uchiha said nothing in response as he shook his head before opening his door making his way into his home. Such a gentleman, NYA, Kuroka teased with a saucy grin. Sasuke rolled his eyes at the response but didn't bother hiding the incredibly small smirk on his face. Naruto sighed quietly as he gently shifted Kunu's sleeping form in his arms. The little Kayubi was currently passed out in his arms as he slowly trekked through Yusaka's large compound. Every yokai he passed by either cooed at the scene or gave him polite smiles and greetings. The embarrassment had long since faded and he felt rather happy. He had been drifting for a while ever since landing in this new world. It was still a bitter pill to swallow that his home had been destroyed. He lacked purpose now. Lacked a goal. Well, a goal that could compare to being the Hokage that is. He had dreamed of the moment ever since he was a child. He'd never achieve it now. And it was a tough thing to process for him. He was just glad his family was here with him. He didn't want to know what would have happened had he entered this world alone. Those dark and depressing thoughts drifted away as Kuno groaned softly into his arms. Pa. Papa. She mewled cutely. Her tails unconsciously wrapped around his torso and waist as she snuggled deeper into his embrace. Naruto's cerulean orbs softened as he gazed at the young yokai. His right hand slowly moved on its own accord, resting upon her blonde locks. The little girl leaned into his touch as he gently stroked her hair. This is your goal now. Naruto acknowledged Kurama's statement but didn't respond. He didn't need to. Kurama already knew. You'll protect it like you did us. The blonde Jinchuriki idly nodded at Kurama's statement, parting the girl's thick strands and softly rubbing her pudgy cheeks. Naruto sensed her presence but he was far more focused on his actions than acknowledging Yusaka and her soft gaze. Rude? Possibly. But, she adores you. Naruto's eyes shift away from the young Kayubi before settling on Yusaka. Yeah. Yeah I know, he replies softly. Noticing his slightly off tone, Yusaka glides to his side. Subconsciously leaning onto the teen, she began to stroke her daughter's head. Does it make you nervous? She questioned after a few moments of silence. The Jinchuriki was quiet for a few seconds before pursing his lips. I've never really had a little sister or a little brother, never mind a daughter. Yusaka's eyes left her daughter as she gazed at the young teen beside her. A soft smile settled on her face as she leaned her head on the boy's shoulder. Take it one step at a time. There's no need to rush. Naruto smiled softly before closing his eyes and stroking the young yokai's head. I don't have a choice in the matter do I? Nope, Yusaka immediately responded with a satisfied smile. The teen chuckled at the woman's response before tentatively brushing his hand across Yusaka's own. Before Naruto could even think to pull his hand back, Yusaka snatched it and held onto it. You're mine now. Sakura's glossy eyes stared into the mirror, gazing upon her reflection with a despondent expression. Her pink crop top sweater laid on her bed, her yoga pants strewn on the edge of her bed. A modest looking black bra holding her rather small breasts up coupled with her lacy black thong covered her intimate areas. Dainty fingers trailed along her toned abdomen, tracing the rather hardened muscles and small amount of scars on her stomach. Her fingers slowly trailed north, idly caressing her modest-sized breasts before traveling further north. Gazing into the mirror with a hollow gaze, Sakura gripped her biceps. Her arms flexed involuntarily, biceps bulging showing off her rather impressive muscles and chest. The pinkette twirled on the tips of her toes, back now facing the mirror. She turned her head towards the direction of the reflection, spotting the odd and rather small scars upon her toned back. Sakura's dainty hands slowly curved around her body, 
fingers dancing upon the toned muscles before eventually cupping her rather supple rear. Confirmed. Dump truck. Nodding to herself in satisfaction she eventually twirled back to face her reflection. Head tilted and eyes glossy, Sakura spoke quietly yet firmly. I'm enough. And the full brunt of the Shinto pantheon will rain true hell down upon your people. Fear flowed through her veins as Sona stared directly into the yokai representative's mismatched orbs. Glowing orbs pierced through her very soul, dissecting her and dismissing her as nothing more than trash. Power. Pure, unadulterated power sat atop her shoulders, threatening to crush her should she so much as twitch. That violet-ringed orb, which she had thought to be quite beautiful, now threatened to snuff out her very existence. His other orb. It made Sona sick. Her stomach lurched as she stared at the unique design of his eye. Similar to his violet one, it bristled and pulsated, spinning in an abnormal way and leaking ill intent. Her body. It was failing her. His power was suffocating her. She couldn't breathe. Sona's hands instinctively flew to her throat, as if somehow capable of alleviating the pressure and discomfort forming from Sasuke's raw display of strength. Throat tightening and tears forming in the edge of her eyes, Sona could do nothing but stare at her demise. A teen no older than she. No, not a teen. She refused to believe it, she couldn't comprehend it. Sasuke couldn't be her age. His power rivaled her sister, possibly even overshadowing it. No 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 no. Then he moved. Sona's violet orbs stretched as Sasuke took slow and measured steps towards her comatose position. Fear paralyzed her and with each step he took, she was that much closer to her death. No, stay back. Stop, please, she screamed fearfully, only to realize that she couldn't speak. She willed her body to do something, anything. He was getting closer. That sick miasma of chakra and power seeped through his very pores as he continued to close the distance. With each step that he took, the vice around Sona's neck tightened. Please, stop. No, she mentally screamed. Her eyes burned as tears fell freely down her face. And then he was upon her. His left hand rose towards her and Sona could do nothing but stare helplessly as it inched towards her. She was reduced to nothing more than a stuttering mess. A rabbit that had ran for as long as possible only for the wolf to catch her in its jaws. She was his prey. A strangled cry finally escaped her throat as his hand gripped her chin tightly, like a parent would do when their child was disobeying them. His touch was firm and powerful and it burned her skin. His calloused fingers dug into the skin of her cheeks, not enough to draw blood but enough to know that should she defy him. I'm going to break you. Sona's eyes snapped open as a scream tore through her throat, shredding her vocal cords. Her heartbeat pounded in her ears, adrenaline coursing though her veins and sweat dripping off her skin. Her chest ached and her lungs burned, as if she had just ran 20 kilometers without the use of her powers. Her short ebony tresses clung to her face, sleek with sweat from her nightmare. Sona's violet orbs finally focused as she instinctively reached for the glasses that sat on her nightstand. Her hands fumbled for a bit, fingers shaking as the adrenaline had yet to wear off. Shakily gripping her spectacles and careful to not break them, Sona placed the glasses on her face. Her breathing had calmed down, if only a bit, as her eyes adjusted to the darkness. Her heart was hammering so fast that she feared for her health. Sona's hands clasped together, fingers ringing atop one another in a manner befitting a child. She cursed herself for resorting to an old habit, believing to have gotten rid of that nervous and anxious tick. She had been an incredibly shy child when she was younger and had developed a habit of playing with her hands and fingers when she was scared or nervous. Violet eyes falling to her lap, Sona grimaced as her fingers shook while ringing against one another. Her eyes strayed away from her hands and towards her naked legs. Her blanket had clearly been kicked off her body and sent to the floor during her sleep. Sona clenched her eyes shut while tightly gripping her left wrist with her right hand. Her face contorted in a painful manner as her nails dug into her skin, forcefully drawing blood. Fear was only triumphed by pain and inducing it was no different. She could feel the warm liquid on her fingers as she continued to grip her wrist tightly. Her heartbeat had finally calmed down enough to where she could hear herself think. Once her heart settled, her body quickly followed suit. The shaking had died down and was virtually gone. While she was still slick with sweat, she could bear it for now. The sea tree heiress relinquished her hold on her wrist, violet eyes staring down at the blood coating her wrists with an expression of apathy, though her face said one thing her mind said another. That had been the third nightmare this week. Sona flicked her left wrist, uncaring of the crimson liquid that stained her floor and bedsheets. She inhaled deeply as she scooted backwards, colliding with the headboard of her bed. Despite finally having calmed down enough to think rationally she still focused on that nightmare despite knowing that she shouldn't. Her experience with Sasuke had scarred her. Sona's legs twitched and a familiar feeling of discomfort nestled near her pelvis. 
Her legs twitched again, of their own accord, and she bit back the hiss that wished to escape through her teeth. Ignoring the growing sensation between her legs Sona reached over towards her nightstand, grabbing a bottle of water. Her dainty fingers untwisted the cap as she tilted the bottle towards her lips, greedily swallowing the liquid. After thoroughly quenching her thirst, the heiress lifted her glasses up and wiped her face clean of any lingering sweat. Another twitch of her legs caused an unnecessary heat to spark between her legs. Sona clenched her eyes tightly, teeth gritting by proxy. Why? Why? Sona knew exactly what was happening but she chose to ignore it. The consequences of such actions and thoughts only spurned her forward. A hiss released through her clenched teeth and she was powerless to prevent it. Why? Why? Stop it. No matter how hard Sona tried, the feeling of pleasure persisted. Her legs continued to twitch and her fingers practically itched towards her pelvis. The heiress shook her head causing her short tresses of hair to sway back and forth. Desperately trying to distract herself from her growing libido, Sona bit down on her lip. The pain seemed to only fuel her already increasing lust. God damn you. She ignored the pulse of pain that emanated from her curse as her fingers dug deep into the fabric of her bed sheets. Sona's rational and more logical side of her brain protested heavily against her arousal. She knew it was wrong. But damn it it felt so good. Every day she cursed her inner sin. Like a double-edged sword, it was both a blessing and a curse. For the sin of lust was a powerful sin. Lust was, unique. For it had many devices and avenues. Most would categorize lust as is, sexual desires. While correct, lust was far more complex than that. It was more so an intense craving of something. That of sexual pleasure and desire being one of them. One could lust after power. Knowledge. Money. Lust was far too broad of a term to only be used when in conjunction with sex. Sona lusted after many things. Knowledge being the keen one above others. But like the double-edged analogy she had given it, it could backfire. Why couldn't she have had a simpler sin? She would have been fine with greed. At least then she wouldn't have these mixed feelings about. That carnal desire rose to the surface instantaneously, nearly blanketing all of her thoughts. A grunt escaped her clenched teeth and Sona had to physically prevent herself from acting out on that sexual desire. Why? Damn it why? It didn't help that she actively chose to suppress her inner desires and sin. It would do her no good to display these thoughts and actions. While someone like Rias could tame and control her greed, Sona could not tame her lust. For greed was simple to understand and comprehend. Lust was not. The Citri heiress would have laughed at herself had she not been trying to curb her libido. Not five minutes ago she had been but a stuttering mess, terrified of him. And now she wanted to, too. Sona slammed her head against her mahogany headboard. Her legs twitched and heat spread through her core causing her thighs to rub together. A pitiful whimper escaped her lips as she clawed at the thin fabric of her sheets. Her toes began to curl, nearly becoming painful as her thoughts continued to delve deeper about the ebony-haired teen. The heat emanating from between her legs practically exploded upon centering around Sasuke. Oh Satan, she wanted him. She wanted those beautiful eyes of his to gaze down upon her like he had done in that office. Flaring his power and speaking to her like she was nothing but trash. A low mule escaped Sona as she relinquished her hold upon her sheets. Her fingers danced towards her pelvis and she made no move or action to prevent it. Sasuke had absolutely terrified her. And it only seemed to strengthen the lust she was already feeling. Sona knew that this was wrong. The yokai faction had been at odds with the devil race since the incident with Kuroka. While not as versed in politics as her mother and father were, Sona knew that the Shinto pantheon had only stayed their hand due to Yusaka's words. The yokai leader had pull and sway in regards to how the Shinto faction acted, at least to some degree. The Shinto faction wasn't considered a top faction, mostly due to their little size and lack of a powerful army. But their gods were powerful. Japan was their territory after all and fighting a god on their soil was nothing short of suicidal. One must be egregiously powerful to even hope to challenge a god on their home turf. The devils were powerful and every faction knew this. But Sona knew that even the Satans would be wary in going to war with the Shinto faction in Japan. The odds weren't in their favor and fighting Amaterasu in the middle of the day was not ideal in the slightest. A low-pitched whine escaped Sona's throat as she pleasured herself, thoughts ceasing almost immediately. Fuck the gods. Fuck the potential repercussions. Fuck everything that wasn't centered around Sasuke dominating her. Oh, Sona knew that at some point she'd need to curb these thoughts about the teen but right now. The heiress, eyes rolled into the back of her head as her middle finger joined her index. Her knees bent inward, trapping her fingers inside herself. 
A harsh shudder racked her body as a wordless scream tore through her throat. Sona exhaled harshly as her body continued to twitch from her orgasm. The high persisted for several minutes and she continued to ride it, uncaring of how dirty and troubling her thoughts were. She wanted Sasuke. And she'd get him. Sasuke stirred the soup in his bowl for several minutes, lost in thought. His mismatched orbs were unfocused as he stared at nothing in particular. Whatcha thinking bout, NYA? Kuroka finally questioned, tail swaying idly. Sasuke blinked at the sudden intrusion and slowly turned his head towards to his right, spotting Kuroka with her own bowl of soup though hers was empty. He eyed her for a moment before returning his gaze to his untouched food. Nothing, he muttered quietly. Doesn't sound like nothing ggg. She replied playfully, licking her spoon clean. The Uchiha's lip descended downward for a moment before he schooled his expression. He was sure that Kuroka had caught the change though. The Neko show was incredibly perceptive. It doesn't matter. He eventually bit out after a few seconds of silence, sounding more bitter than he intentionally meant to. Kuroka's playful expression disappeared as she stared at the teen. She placed her spoon on the table before speaking earnestly. That's not true. It does matter. Her chair scrapped against the wooden floors, moving towards the teen. You can talk to me. If you want, of course. Sasuke idly noticed that her verbal tick wasn't present. It was, odd. He had grown used to the incessant and unnecessary nayas that escaped the woman's mouth when speaking. The Uchiha was silent for several minutes, debating on whether or not to speak about his thoughts. Finally deciding that keeping his thoughts to himself wasn't ideal, he opened his mouth to speak. I, I miss my home, he uttered quietly, eyes downcast and staring at his bowl of food. I've been distracting myself with anything that could help take my mind off these thoughts but. He trailed off silently, not necessarily wanting or needing a reply from the Neko show. He just wanted to get it off his shoulders, at least that's what he was telling himself. What was your home like? Kuroka questioned softly, a hint of understanding in her voice. Sasuke debated on even entertaining the question. He barely knew Kuroka and she him. What was the point? They were practically strangers. Sure, he may have told her a part of his life but that was only because their situations were relatively similar to one another. Again, he told himself that this was the reason and nothing else. It was. Sasuke struggled for a moment, trying to find the right words. Hell. He eventually scoffed out. Shaking his head, he continued. Every day was a struggle. No matter the accomplishments I made, the sweat and blood I lost. It was never enough. Sasuke's rinnegan glowed beneath his bangs as he stared down at his unfinished food. There were good days. Memories of his mother's smiling face entered his head before quickly disappearing. But I was surrounded by misery. The image of his dying mother appeared in his head and it took far more energy to make it disappear than he'd want to admit. The Uchiha shook his head as a minor pang of pain laced his mind. I did so many abhorrent things in my life. I wanted to atone for those actions and become, better. But, he trailed off once more and didn't bother continuing, wanting to hide away and ignore these persistent feelings. You wanted to be better. Kuroka spoke, tone soft and gentle. But, she questioned with a tilted head, wanting Sasuke to finish his sentence. The Uchiha did not hesitate as much this time as he did the previous times. But, I do not deserve the second chance I was given. And why is that, NYA? Kuroka questioned almost immediately. Because you did bad things. A frown etched on the teen's face. You're simplifying it. Am I? She challenged with a tilted head, tail swaying back and forth. No one's perfect and we all make mistakes. Annoyance crept its way into Sasuke's heart. He didn't bother hiding it on his face either. That means nothing to me. Umhum. You're lying but okay. She shrugged nonchalantly. You say you don't deserve it but that's not for you to decide. You've done bad things but I guarantee you've done good things as well. Don't let your self-loathing dictate your future actions. You are better than that. Sasuke's fist clenched and before thinking, he snapped back. You don't even fucking know me. Why does it matter? If the Neko show was affected by her words then she did little to show it. It does matter. Why? NYA. Because you wouldn't be here otherwise. If you're as bad as you think you are then you would have killed yourself to atone for those actions. Kuroka shook her head causing her long tresses to frame her beautiful face. Are you going to give up? Because you're facing adversity, is that what you want to do, Sasuke? Give up. Anger flared to life in Sasuke's heart as his Sharingan subconsciously reacted to his anger. His chakra threatened to explode due to the woman's words. Not at Kuroka herself but at the thought of giving in to his despair and self-loathing. Fists clenched and face set in a scowl, he replied. No. 
Kuroka tilted her head with a raised eyebrow. You sure? Because it seemed like you wanted to give up just a second ago, hmm. Is that you what you do in the face of adversity, Sasuke? Give up. She was goading him. He knew it and she definitely knew that he knew she was purposely doing it. The annoying thing about it was that it was working. I've never given anything up. He stated with a growl, fist coming down onto the wooden table and shattering it with his strength. The utensils crashed into the ground, breaking and splattering the unfinished food on the floor. Kuroka met Sasuke's vicious stare with a blank one of her own. While she wasn't necessarily terrified or scared of Sasuke, she knew she was treading a thin line. He was a walking atomic bomb and while Kuroka could definitely sense the other chakra signature that practically dwarfed Sasuke's own chakra, it wasn't guaranteed that they were stronger than him. Kuroka's hands grasped the boy's clenched fist, pulling it towards her lap and speaking. Then don't start now, continue to be the person you want to be, to be the person you need to be. She gently stroked the boy's hand as she continued. I think it's admirable that you want to be a better person even after suffering so much. Kuroka's eyes strayed away from Sasuke's own, towards the framed picture that sat across the room. Sasuke's eyes slowly followed hers and he noticed that the framed picture of his mother wasn't face down as it was supposed to be. Before he could question why that was, Kuroka spoke once more. You have her eyes. She continued to stroke the boy's hand, well aware of the tension in his body. I'm sure she's proud of you. And I'm positive that no matter what choices you make, she'll always love you. A kind smile blossomed on Kuroka's face as her eyes closed. It's a mother's job to love and protect their children after all. Sasuke's eyes trailed back and forth from the picture of his mother and to Kuroka. A conflicted expression painted his face and he didn't know whether to be angry or happy. How could he face his mother knowing that he had become a monster? How could she be proud that he had abandoned his home for power? How could she love a monster? No matter what you decide to do from now on, I will love you forever. Itachi's final words echoed in his head as he stared at Kuroka's gentle smile. His bottom lip twitched for a moment as his eyes watered. After Itachi's death, he had promised himself that he wouldn't cry anymore. He had shed enough tears for his family and his mother. But maybe, just this once, he would allow the tears fall once more. Naruto stared at Kakashi as he informed Yusaka, as well as Yusaka's counsel, about what had happened during their trip to Kuo. He wasn't surprised. Not in the slightest. Team Seven's luck had never been good. Simple tasks and missions usually became life or death situations very quickly. But it was kinda cool that Kakashi had a dragon inside him now. They were almost similar in that regard. He was happy for his sensei. Now Kakashi could become even stronger, at least if the words of Yusaka and the other council members were to be trusted. Apparently the divine dividing sacred gear was super strong. Naruto could see why. Having the power attack of your opponent was incredibly powerful. It was also very cheap. Naruto was old school in the way of combat. Yes, he was a shinobi and underhanded tactics were basically their thing but he preferred his fights with his fists. And yes, he was very much aware of the fact that his shadow clones were cheap. What was that boy thinking? Risking war like that, a yokai ranted to Naruto's immediate left. Naruto would have scoffed if he didn't want their ire to focus on himself. That was just like Sasuke to do something like that. He was sure that his best friend had a reason. Sasuke's goal was to purposely intimidate and antagonize the heiresses into responding to his threat. Had they given a response that was aggressive, he would have pounced on it. It was calculated and ruthless. Kakashi explained simply, dressed in new clothes so as to not answer useless questions. He had already briefly explained his run-in with Bali. Grafia's involvement was taken into account but we did not fully believe their relationship was tight-knit enough to warrant an appearance. They operate on our soil, anything taken as a slight to the yokai is dangerous for them. Kakashi shifted in his standing position, wishing to whip out his book and read. We had hoped to pressure the girls into making a rash decision but it failed. The devils will be informed regardless and our task was accomplished. It was rash and completely uncalled for. You bring unnecessary risk to our people. Another random yokai commented out, displeased with how Kakashi and Sasuke chose to handle the meeting. The silver-haired Jonan glanced at the man before placing his hands into his pockets. I don't remember asking for your opinion, councilman. I, quite frankly, do not care about what you view as right or wrong. My mission was to inform the heiresses that the yokai faction, and by proxy the Shinto faction, seek reparations. How it was accomplished does not matter. What does matter is that it was accomplished. A snort of laughter escaped Naruto and he didn't bother trying to hide it. What Kakashi said was incredibly savage. And correct. 
but mostly savage. Is something funny, boy? The yokai to Naruto's left snarled in annoyance. Naruto's cerulean orbs cut directly to the man as he stared at him. Yeah, it was funny. Kakashi sensei is a funny man. Don't ya think? He questioned back rhetorically with a sly smile. The yokai snarled once more and before he could speak, Yusaka raised her hand to halt any further hostilities. Calm yourselves, she demanded with hardened eyes. Once the room became silent, she gazed back at Kakashi and gestured with her hand. Kakashi-san, continue. The jonin shrugged his shoulders, ignoring the nasty looks he received from some of the other yokai. Afterwards, Sasuke and I went to confront Kuroka and her group of supernaturals. We fought, they lost, and I am now the owner of Divine Dividing. One of the more neutral yokai spoke aloud, tone curious. Who exactly wielded the sacred gear? Also, how are you now in possession of the Longinus? To our knowledge, sacred gears manifest in humans during their birth. Regardless of tier and power, all sacred gears follow this rule. Kakashi glanced at the female yokai for a moment before shrugging his shoulders. His name was Bali. He was a devil-human hybrid who boasted an incredible amount of raw power on top of possessing the divine dividing. During the end of the exchange, Sasuke deemed him enough of a threat and killed him, taking the sacred gear out of his body and transferring it to me. Sasuke killed him, Naruto questioned with a raised brow, arms crossed against his chest. Glancing towards his former student, Kakashi nodded. I assume that sacred gears function like the biju do. If you take them out, the user dies. Could it have to do with the fact that divine dividing is sentient? The blonde questioned while leaning back in his chair. I sense an actual signature inside your body now, sensei. Before Kakashi could answer that question, Albion spoke telepathically. It does not matter if the sacred gear is sentient or not. Taking it from the human it was originally given to will result in their death. All of the yokai, along with Naruto, were surprised to hear the voice of an unknown individual inside their minds. I didn't know you could do that, Albion. Kakashi commented with a raised brow. There's a lot you don't know, partner. Bali was not some random devil, hybrid either. He was a descendant of the original Lucifer. The room went silent at that information. As always, Team 7 continues to have bad luck. Naruto commented with a shake of his head. If he's a descendant of the original Satan then that means the devils will have a reason to want war. He trailed off as a frown formed on his face. That is not necessarily true. Albion spoke up once more. Bali may be the descendant of the original Lucifer but he was not affiliated with the devil faction. He resents his heritage. In fact, he was a part of the terrorist group that goes by the Chaos Brigade. Naruto blinked at the information, ignoring how the yokai in the room gasped at the information. Wait, so he was working under Ophis. Again, the room went completely silent at how casually Naruto spoke regarding Ophis. That is correct, Albion confirmed with a nod that went unseen. However, it is more appropriate to say that he was in the group to find strong opponents to fight and defeat. He did not necessarily care about Ophis' goal. Huh, Naruto commented nonchalantly with a raised eyebrow. I haven't seen Ophis since she dropped us off in Kyoto. Wonder what she's up to. An immense and incredible pressure appeared out of thin air following Naruto's words. A mountain's worth of pressure settled upon Naruto's shoulders who seemed to be relatively undisturbed. His cerulean orbs turned towards the source of the power and a happy smile formed on his face. Ophis Chan. Floating in midair directly in the center of the room was the infinite dragon god herself, Ophis. Her blank eyes scanned the room for several seconds, passing over the random yokai and disregarding nearly every one of them. Her eyes eventually swept past Kakashi, sensing the dragon inside of him. You hold Albion now, she stated blankly, slowly descending from the air and landing without a sound. It seems Bali is in fact dead. Kakashi raised an eyebrow, not as affected by her presence as he was during their first meeting. Hello, Ophis Chan, it is nice to see you again. How are you? The dragon stared at Kakashi for several moments in silence before slowly making her way to his position. Though she was no longer in her childlike form, opting to choose the form that Team 7 had convinced her to shapeshift into, she was still nearly two heads shorter than Kakashi. The draconic woman stopped in front of Kakashi, head tilted up towards the man and eyes blank. And she stared, and stared, and stared. Pat my head, she demanded rather than requested. Kakashi blinked at the demand before tilting his head. Say, please, it is rude to demand things, Ophis Chan. The little dragon blinked at the statement before tilting her head cutely. Please pat my head, she corrected easily. A smile appeared on Kakashi's face as he rose his gloved hand towards the woman's head. 
After several seconds of head pats, he placed his hand back into his pocket before speaking. Better. He asked with a raised eyebrow. The dragon only nodded her head. After doing so, she turned her head towards Naruto's position, spotting the teen sitting beside Yasaka. Naruto. She stated blankly while nodding her head. I came to confirm Valley's death. It appears that he is indeed dead. While he was useful to my overall goal, his death does not hamper it. I'm sure he wasn't that bad of a guy. Naruto defended with a raised eyebrow. Wrong. Kakashi corrected. He was definitely an asshole. He gave off asshole vibes. Albion did not bother correcting Kakashi because even he knew that was the truth. Where have you been Ofus chan The pseudo Jubi Jinchuriki questioned curiously. We haven't seen you in forever. Ofus regarded the statement for a moment before replying. I was busy. Understandable. Naruto replied easily, not really bothered by the woman's cryptic answer. She had saved them from perishing in the elemental nations. If she wanted to vaguely answer then that was her right. Ofus was silent for a moment as her head tilted curiously. While Valley is dead, it seems his team is not. Turning her head back towards Kakashi she spoke. Why is only Valley dead? The silver-haired Jonin shrugged his shoulders lazily, reaching into his pocket and procuring his hentai manga. Sasuke deemed Valley a big enough annoyance, threat that he needed to be killed. It is not like his teammates were truly that close. They didn't seem that affected by his death. Appearances can be deceiving. Ofus replied blankly. Isn't that the pot calling the kettle black? Naruto questioned rhetorically. I do not own a pot or a kettle. Why would they be black? Is that of significance? The dragon questioned with a cute tilt of the head. Naruto chuckled loudly as he responded. Never mind, it isn't that important. Ofus didn't pursue the boy's statement and only nodded her head. I will be taking my leave then. I only wish to check up on things. However, if you need to speak directly to me then just speak my name with intent. I will appear. Goodbye Naruto, Kakashi. The infinite dragon god disappeared almost immediately after, her presence completely vanishing as if she hadn't been in the room. There was several long seconds of awkward silence that hung in the room. Well, that was surely interesting. Kakashi commented offhandedly. The room practically erupted into chaos after his statement. Sakura's eyes lazily fluttered open. She immediately clenched them shut as the light from the sun pierced through her bedroom window. A moment later she groaned out in pain. My Hiead. Her hands immediately rose to her temples as she gently massaged her head. She definitely drank far too much last night. Green chakra bloomed to life in her hands as she began to reduce the effects of the hangover. After purging the effects of the alcohol she slowly rose to her feet. Emerald orbs blinked several times as she noticed the copious amounts of empty liquor bottles. She spotted. One, two, three. Five. Five bottles. Kami, she was becoming more like Tsunade with each day that passed. She shouldn't be allowed to get her hands on alcohol. Rubbing her face, she sifted through her dresser, grabbing several articles of clothing before making her way into the bathroom to take a shower. Stripping herself of her clothing, Sakura made to step into the shower before pausing as she caught a glimpse of her reflection in the large mirror of her bathroom. Sakura proceeded to stare at her body with a tilted head. Unlike many of the times where she used to stare at her naked body, something felt different, she couldn't pinpoint it. The pinkette continued to stare at her body, noticing the hardened muscles and odd scars that covered her body. She made a face as she focused on her intimate parts and pursed her lips as she did so. Why did something feel different? After another moment of confusion, Sakura shrugged her shoulders with a small smile before stepping into the shower. She could figure out what was wrong later. Right now though? She stank. After properly cleaning and grooming herself, Sakura returned to the large mirror. She continued to stare at her reflection, analyzing each and every part of her body with a critical eye. There was nothing wrong. Why? She usually always found something wr. Wait. Nothing was wrong? Sakura's emerald orbs fluttered several times as she focused on her body. She twisted her body several times, bending and contorting her body as if trying to find something that was wrong. She even began to flex her muscles, showing off her rather impressive biceps and abdomen. There was still nothing wrong. But, that, nothing was wrong, nothing, was wrong. Sakura continued to repeat the mantra in her head before it finally clicked. She didn't find anything wrong with her body because there was nothing wrong with her body. The girl's dainty fingers trailed along her rather muscular form with a smile that was as radiant as the sun. There was nothing wrong. Tears slowly formed in her eyes as she covered her mouth, trying desperately to quiet the happy sobs that escaped her throat. Nothing was wrong. Before Sakura could continue her sudden realization, a knock at her door rang out. Blinking several times in slight surprise, Sakura hurriedly dried her eyes before speaking loudly. 
one second. The pinkette proceeded to dash through her room, throwing together an outfit and heading for the door. She opened the door and raised an eyebrow at the servant. Greetings Sakura-sama. Asuna bowed at the hip before slowly rising. Yusaka-sama has requested your presence, she has a mission for you. The medic blinked before offering the wolf yokai a small smile. Lead the way, Asuna. And please, there's no need to be so formal. Asuna said nothing in response but only nodded her head with a smile. Without another word, she began to make her way towards Yusaka's office. On normal occasions, Sakura would have struck up conversation or even attempt to have small talk with Asuna. But right now she was far too giddy in riding the high due to finally overcoming her body issues. For as long as could remember, she had hated the way she looked. Too skinny or too muscular. But now, there was nothing wrong. Sure, she still liked bigger breasts but that was the least of her worries at the moment. It was a win, she felt great, no longer was there this invisible weight and voice that hovered over her telling she was worthless and not good enough. She was beautiful, she loved how she looked. She still couldn't properly believe it but she felt amazing. The duo arrived at Yusaka's office several minutes later. Asuna proceeded to bow before slowly rising and offering a smile to Sakura. You seem very happy today, Sakura-sama. It was nice to see you again. The pinkett's cheeks turned rosy for a moment as she smiled embarrassingly. It's that obvious. Asuna chuckled as she responded. Very much so. Whatever it is that has you so happy, I'm glad. You seemed very stressed over the past week. The wolf yokai bowed once more before turning around and speaking. Good luck on your mission, Sakura-sama. After bidding the wolf yokai her goodbyes, Sakura opened the door to Yusaka's office. She blinked several times upon noticing how many people were actually in the room. Her emerald eyes trailed over all of the yokai before landing on Yusaka and Naruto. With her head tilted, Sakura wondered why Naruto was here. Actually, yeah, never mind, she knew exactly why he was here. The conversation between her and Yusaka had been about Naruto before she eventually downed an entire liquor bottle. Not her best moment that was for sure. Sakura, how are you? Naruto greeted boisterously. A smile found its way to her face as she greeted Naruto, though in a more controlled and calm manner. Naruto. Yusaka-sama. She bowed before continuing. I'm doing well, Naruto. Very well. Her blonde teammate was silent for a moment, his cerulean eyes growing exceptionally sharp as he stared directly at her. The boy's action had almost taken her aback. You seem different. He probed quietly for a moment, hand coming up to stroke his chin. He continued to stare at her for a few more seconds before shrugging his shoulders, not bothering to think about it any further. Well, whatever it is I hope it's good for you. Sakura offered the boy a smile as she nodded her head. Thank you, Naruto. He said nothing but did give her a cheesy thumbs up. Greetings, Sakura. Yusaka finally spoke, offering the girl a polite nod of the head. It seems some things have come up that require your expertise. Sakura blinked at the statement as she tilted her head. Do you need me to teach medics? Or develop some kind of cure that only affects yokai? Or do you need me to destroy something? I'm pretty good at that. An amused smile split Yusaka's features as she replied. Oh, I'm very aware of your destructive capabilities. Naruto-kun has told me plenty about that. Her golden orbs traveled towards the boy who adopted a betrayed expression. I have not. He lied. Awfully. Sakura rolled her eyes at the obvious lie before responding. You are the worst liar. I'm not. He yelled back while pointing his finger at the girl. I'm the best damn liar in the world. Era era. Is that so, Naruto-kun? Yusaka spoke up with a large smile. When the boy faltered she proceeded to nod her head. Good boy. The Kayubi turned her attention back on the pink-haired medic before speaking. I do not require your assistance in the medical field nor do I need your power to destroy things. Naruto-kun has spoken of your diplomacy and proclaims that you would be a suitable delegate for the communication between the devil heiresses in Kuo. The medic blinked in slight surprise, her emerald orbs shifting towards Naruto who offered her a smile with a thumbs up. Remaining silent for but a moment, Sakura returned her attention to the leader of the yokai faction before responding. He would be correct. I used to serve as an assistant to the leader of our village. I am knowledgeable about politics and have no issue with resorting to violence should the need arrive. The comment was thrown in offhandedly and while Sakura knew that politics was a patience game, sometimes your fists solve things faster than your words. At least that's what she learned from Tsunade. Rarely was someone ever allowed to say, no, to Tsunade. The woman could destroy mountains with her fists. Being on her bad side was just stupidity. Good. Yusaka commented with a nod of the head. You leave for Kuo today. 
One of my servants will equip you with the resources and information you need. Your living situation has been sorted out and the heiresses are already aware of why you'll be in Kuo. Sakura was silent for a moment before a grimace formed on her face. Please don't tell me that I have to go to their school. Please, for the love of Kami don't send her to school. An amused smile formed on Yusaka's face as she placed her elbows on the table, handed clasped and covering her mouth. That is entirely your choice. The documents and paperwork have already been signed and are ready to turn in. It is your decision whether or not to partake. It would make your job of watching over the heiresses easier, but it is up to you. The Pinket made a face that bordered on disgust and annoyance. Let's just say I did go to Kuo Academy, hypothetically, would I even have to do actual school work? If I do, then no. I'm not doing it and would rather kill myself. Yusaka cleared her throat to hide the laugh that escaped her throat. She failed of course, but nevertheless. You would not have to do any work. Your job is to keep an eye on the heiresses and relay messages between both parties. If trouble surfaces, I expect you to handle it and act accordingly. That goes for stray devils, fallen angels, and any other problems you may come across. While the heiresses occupy Kuo and have been given free range to deal with issues on their own, I want you to handle these issues. Am I understood? Hi, Yusaka-sama, Sakura replied dutifully, reminiscent to her times as a shinobi in Konoha. Nodding her head, Yusaka smiled. Good, that will be all Sakura. You are to head out and meet our yokai informant. He will come to you and pass off the things you will need. Be safe and do not take unnecessary risks. If a situation occurs where you are unsure on how to proceed or if you believe the situation to be out of your hands, then contact myself. If worse comes to pass, then Sasuke will be sent as backup. Sakura nodded her head at the response before offering the woman a bow and exiting the office without another word. I think that went rather well. Naruto commented with a smile. Imhem. Yusaka agreed with a nod of the head. Allow us to continue where we left off yes. She gestured towards the rest of the council who had remained silent during the exchange. Sakura sighed quietly as she held the cell phone in her hand. What an odd and incredibly useful piece of technology. Any basic information that she needed was there. She could look up answers to questions in the matter of seconds. With the object also having the ability to send instant messages and allow you the ability to speak with other individuals who possessed a similar device. It was so useful. Sakura pocketed the cell phone before cracking her neck and taking off in a sprint towards Kuo. Chakra surged through her pores as her speed increased to the point that she was virtually a blur to any yokai and or human. In a matter of seconds, she was out of Kyoto and en route to the city of Kuo. It would take a few hours of constant running to arrive at Kuo but she didn't mind it. She loved to run. After several hours of running, Sakura's speed began to slowly decrease, the city of Kuo finally coming into view. Pulling the phone out of her pocket, Sakura glanced the time, noticing it was nearly 5 p.m. The Pinket nodded her head before continuing to make her way towards the city, passing by cars with little issues and jumping over buildings that blocked her path. It took her another 20 or so minutes for her to finally enter the city. Upon reaching Kuo, she proceeded to focus Chakra into her legs. Bending her knees she leapt up towards the tallest building in Kuo. Her feet made contact with the side of the building before sticking as if her feet were an adhesive. The Pinket proceeded to sprint up the building, being mindful to avoid the large glass windows. Upon reaching the top of the building, Sakura stood on the edge of the large skyscraper. Her emerald orbs drank in the sight of the entire city, easily seeing everything in the city with little issue. Her emerald orbs immediately spotted several points of interest. Two rather large malls on either side of the city, the infamous Kuo High Academy, several other notable schools, and other establishments that could prove helpful to her job. Sakura crossed her arms against her chest as she awaited for her contact to appear on the building. Taking a seat on the edge, Sakura pulled out her phone and began to fiddle with it, trying to learn what she could concerning the device. After ten or so minutes of fiddling with her phone and learning several things about it, she sensed a chakra presence scaling the building. Leaning further over the edge, her emerald orb spotted a rather average and normal-looking yokai scaling the building with relative ease. He seems so, bland. Perhaps that's the reason he's a spy. When the man finally reached the top of the building he spoke and made a gesture with his hand, his thumb and pinky finger extended with his other three fingers clenched. Tuna mayonnaise. Sakura nodded her head before replying. You're right. I'll contact Gojo Sensei. The average-looking man nodded his head before reaching into his jacket and procuring several documents and folders. He passed the items over to Sakura who took them without question. 
The man then repeated the gesture he had used when greeting her. Tuna, tuna. He immediately jumped off the side of the building, not bothering to wait for a response. Sakura's eyes followed the man for several seconds before he seemed to just disappear into thin air. Thinking nothing of it, Sakura reached into her jacket and pulled out a small ceiling scroll. She placed the objects in the center of the scroll before pulsing her chakra. A poof resounded from the scroll, having successfully sealed the objects away. Sakura picked the scroll up before pocketing it once more and leaping off the building. Sakura flipped several times in the air before twisting her body landing on the ground with ease, not even cracking or destroying the concrete from her actions. The medic slowly rose to her feet before making her way towards a random direction in the city. As she passed by the humans, occasionally greeting anyone who greeted her, she stretched her senses out into the city. She wasn't nearly as good of a sensor as Naruto and Sasuke was but she knew a thing or two. It took several minutes for her to eventually sense something but when she did, a large frown formed on her face. She could sense several fallen angel in the city and while a majority nod then were grouped together in the outskirts of the city, she could sense one in the middle of the city. Sakura deduced that this was a pure fallen angel. She had already been informed of Rias and Sona's peerage. While Rias possessed a fallen angel hybrid, she was still a hybrid and would this give off a different signature. Kakashi's report about the feeling wasn't matching what she could currently sense. The pinkette immediately set off towards the direction she could sense the fallen angel. Upon growing closer to the area, she could spot what appeared to be some kind of barrier. Sakura stared at the barrier for several seconds before pulling out a kanai and prodding it, making sure that she could actually physically destroy it without harming herself. When her kanai failed to disintegrate, burn, or any other way that would maim the woman, she nodded her head. Sakura's right fist clenched as she chambered her fist towards her chest. Her muscles flexed as chakra practically exploded outward from her chambered fist. The girl released a warrior cry as her fist detonated against the barrier. Upon making contact with the barrier it practically disintegrated, not being able to even stand up to Sakura's abnormal strength. The medic proceeded to make her way farther into the barrier, spotting the fallen angel flying in the air. Her eyebrows furrowed as she spotted a human boy lying on the ground with a large hole in his chest. Her medical training immediately kicked in and Sakura practically blurred to the boy's side, shocking the fallen angel at the sheer speed in which she appeared. Apparently the creature hadn't sensed her destroy said barrier with little issue. Who are you? The scantily clad woman questioned, black wings flapping idly. Sakura ignored the insignificant woman as her hands alighted with chakra. Placing her hands over the boy's chest she proceeded to direct chakra into the boy's wounds. Several seconds passed by in silence before Sakura's eyebrows furrowed. Why wasn't it working? He was still alive. He should be able to receive the healing. The brown-haired teen blinked weakly as blood ejected from his mouth, staining his academy uniform. Be beautiful. He weakly complimented. Sakura ignored the compliment as she continued to try to heal the boy's sizzling wound. She didn't understand why he wasn't healing. It was as if his body was actively rejecting the chakra. Sakura's sixth sense shrieked at her and she immediately tilted her head to the side. A bright light zoomed past her face, impacting against the ground several meters away from her and exploding. Sakura's attention finally left the brown-haired teen as she stared at the fallen angel slowly moving towards her position. An annoyed scoff left her mouth as the woman reared her hand back, golden energy forming in her hands. If you're going to interrupt my kill then I'll zhu. The fallen angel was unable to finish her sentence as Sakura disappeared into thin air. Satenkyaku. The fallen angel was physically incapable of reacting as Sakura's heel descended upon the woman's back. A harsh snap echoed through the area followed by a sonic boom and then ending in a loud explosion as the woman's body impacted the cement. The fallen angel was killed near instantaneously due to the force and strength from Sakura's attack. Sakura landed on the ground before sweeping her arm through the smoke and dust she had kicked up from her attack. Her emerald orbs immediately spotted the mangled corpse of the fallen angel. The woman's body was contorted in a grotesque manner with her spine practically exiting through her stomach. Bones stuck up from the woman's skin, indicating that the force had been far too much for her to handle. Sakura scoffed quietly before returning to the dying boy's side and kneeling beside him. A frown etched itself onto her face as she noticed the boy's laboring breaths getting heavier and raspier. She didn't understand why she couldn't heal his wound. She had treated plenty of other yokai with their injuries and even some humans. Why was his body in particular rejecting her chakra? Sakura placed her hand on the boy's chest, being mindful to not place any pressure on his wound. A sad expression formed on her face as she spoke. I'm sorry. I can't save you. She lowered her head, saddened that the life of a young human teen had been snuffed out for no apparent reason. A wet cough answered her followed by the boy's voice. Sanat. 
or fault. A harsh cough had his chest rising and falling, blood seeping out from his gruesome wound. Sakura returned her gaze to the boy's face, noticing his brown hair was matted and caked with blood. He was relatively average, but she could admit that he was slightly handsome. What's your name? She asked quietly, wanting to provide comfort for the boy. I say. Hi Hyoto. His voice trailed off quietly as blood continued to dribble down his mouth. His chest rose and fell one last time as a raspy exhale left his mouth. Sakura's eyes closed as she bowed her head, offering a silent prayer for the now dead boy. Her hand proceeded to rest directly over his wound as she spoke. I'll avenge you, Issei Hyoto. You did not deserve to die so young. Sakura's emerald orbs hardened and as she began to rise, a surge of red energy vacated the boy's chest before shooting directly into her body. Sakura's eyes widened dramatically before the feeling of fire spread throughout her entire body. She released a scream of pain before falling to her knees. Her nails dug deep into her skin, drawing blood as she struggled to understand what was happening. The pain, oh Kami, it was almost unbearable, everything was on fire, she couldn't even properly think. The pain only seemed to grow stronger and stronger as Sakura's body hunched over. Her forehead made impact with the cement as she continued to scream out in sheer pain. Finally unable to take any more, Sakura's eyes clenched tightly before her entire body went slack. Before she could fully succumb to the darkness, she glimpsed a red, draconic-looking gauntlet upon her left hand. Her body made impact with the ground a moment later as she was rendered unconscious. Fuck. Fick fuck fuck. Rias cursed angrily as she sprinted through the city of Kuo. Damn it. I let myself get distracted for one minute. One minute. She berated herself silently, crimson hair flailing wildly behind her. The heiress had seen Issei exit the school with his girlfriend, several hours ago. It was going according to plan and her familiar had informed her that the couple had finished their date and were making their way to one of the parks in Kuo. It was all going according to plan. Up until she was distracted by a call from her brother. Sinuva bitch. She grit her teeth angrily as she rounded corner after corner, speeding past random humans without a care. All she had to do was wait until, Yuma, showed her true colors. She'd reveal herself as a fallen angel and try to kill Issei for his sacred gear. Of course she would fail in her endeavor and Rias would show up at the last second to save Issei from his demise. He'd be indebted to her and she'd then ask him to join her peerage. It was a win-win, he'd get to continue living, albeit as a devil, but alive nonetheless, and she'd get an asset with potential. But of course her beloved brother had to derail everything. Why? She was fine here in Kuo, he was worrying to damn much. While she certainly understood his stance regarding the situation that had happened with Sasuke and the Shinto pantheon, she was still an independent woman. She could do this. Sasuke had absolutely terrified her but she was the leader of this territory, along with Sona of course, and together they'd handle this situation and come to a solution. She had done enough of her own research regarding the situation that had happened with the yokai and the devils, she sympathized heavily with the yokai. They suffered for something out of their control and now Yusaka, with the Shinto Pathion's help, was taking matters into their own hands and cracking down of their region. Japan belonged to the Shinto pantheon, the yokai's home was Japan. Do the math. Rias knew that she was trespassing on their land even if her role said otherwise, she was certain that the yokai in the bigger cities absolutely despised her and Sona. Rias continued to sprint towards the last destination that she had sensed from Issei in the disguised fallen angel. Her eyes strained in the darkness as she caught glimpse of a barrier nearly 50 meters in front of her. She was close. Just a little further, if only Issei hadn't ditched the flyer she snuck into his pocket, she'd have already been there to save him, he might not be. The crimson-haired devil shook her head, ridding herself of those darker thoughts and only proceeded to sprint faster towards her destination. Or she would have, had she not hit the ground due to an unseen force that absolutely shattered the barrier holding Issei hostage. Rhea's eyes widened as the barrier crumbled to the ground before disappearing entirely. Who's there now? She had sensed a brief amount of energy surge before the barrier disintegrated. The heiress quickly rose to her feet before doubling her efforts towards the epicenter of the now destroyed barrier. She made it all of ten feet before a sonic boom erupted from Issei's position. The earth beneath her feet practically exploded as she struggled to find her footing. It took several seconds for the shockwaves to subside and once they did, Rias continued on her journey. Come on, come on, please be alive, please, come on come on come on come on, she mentally chanted. Rias continued to run towards Issei's position before sensing a unique presence. Her eyebrows furrowed in confusion as an abundance of chakra saturated the air and surrounding area. Chakra. Who? Could it be the delegate sent from Kyoto? Rias' eyes widened and hope blossomed in her heart. Maybe. Maybe this person had saved Issei. 
sprinting around one last corner, Rias came upon the epicenter of the barrier and her mouth dropped in horror as she immediately spotted Issei with a giant hole through his stomach. Blood pooled around his body, soaking into his academy uniform. Rias' hands clenched hard enough to draw blood as she continued to make her way towards the boy's position. Her eyes scanned the area and she cringed as she spotted the fallen angel's body. The woman's spine was sticking through her stomach. How the hell did that even happen? The heiress turned away from the disgusting sight before spotting a woman with pink hair. The woman seemed to be unconscious as she tossed and turned while groaning out in pain. She has. So much chakra. Rias made to move towards the girl before a large amount of chakra swept over her, completely halting her movement. Don't move. Rias' eyes shifted wildly across the area as she tried to find the source that had stopped her. What was happening? Why couldn't she move? Out the corner of her eyes she spotted a young man making his way towards the girl's position. Rias would have furrowed her eyebrows if she could. This man. Was that a tattoo on his face? The man, a rather teen, had several markings that covered the lower portion of his face. He had spiky white hair that jutted out in several directions with violet pupils. He wore a high-collar jacket that was currently unbuttoned, revealing his mouth and throat. The violet-eyed teen glanced towards her position before continuing towards the pink-haired woman. He scooped the girl up in his arms before glancing back to Rias and speaking. Kelp. He stated simply before completely vanishing, taking the pink-haired woman with him. As soon as he disappeared, Rias was able to finally overcome her lack of movement. What the hell was that? She exclaimed in confusion. The teen shook her head immediately afterwards before making her way towards Issei. Damn it, she had been too late. An innocent teen had been killed. She was going to get so much shit for this. Why hadn't she just dealt with the fallen angel in the first place? Sakura groaned out in pain as her body writhed in the hands of the yokai spy. Violet eyes strayed towards the woman as an unsure expression formed on his face. He couldn't sense anything that was relatively wrong with the medic but he could sense the entity that now existed in her body. This was going to complicate things. Probably. Anumaki hoped so at least. Redoubling his efforts he adjusted Sakura's body before disappearing into thin air, leaving no trace of their presence. Naruto was silent as he observed Yusaka's inner council bicker with one another. His disinterested orbs strayed over each council member as he rested his temple against his clenched fist, propping his head up. Something is wrong. He mentally spoke to the biju. She will be fine. Karama replied almost instantaneously, no doubt sensing the anomaly in Kuo alongside Naruto. The Jinchuriki debated his partner's words for a moment before accepting them. Sakura was strong. She'd be okay. If not though, he'd take his gloves off and this world would know exactly who he was. Naruto was rounded from his thoughts as dainty fingers glided over his right hand, caressing his digits in a tender manner. The teen glanced towards Yusaka who sported a small smile upon her beautiful face, no doubt sensing his displeasure and disinterest regarding the current meeting. It was mind-numbing. The daily meetings and discussions at least. Day in and day out he'd been forced to listen to the elderly yokai in Yusaka's council spew nonsense about mundane issues. Jibes at he and his team were made multiple times and while Naruto didn't particularly care what they thought, it was still annoying. Though, he could definitely understand the hesitance on their part. Four incredibly powerful humans show up out of the blue, wielding chakra and matching the power of their strongest gods. Yeah, he'd probably be a little antsy and jumpy as well. He'd try to explain his reasoning but had given up on the third day. These yokai were old and stuck in their ways. There was only a handful of young members in the council and they were easily outvoted nine-tenths times. But that was the game of politics wasn't it? The old prevail and the youth are demonized. Adopting a more progressive approach to world views was seen as weakness, which didn't particularly make sense to Naruto. Why would you not want to adopt more open-minded views? Things get done a hell of a lot faster if people are on the same page. Alas, some people enjoyed rereading the same three chapters instead of finishing the damn book. Once more, Naruto was brought out of his thoughts at the tender touch of his. The teen blinked slowly as he glanced towards Yusaka, staring at her with furrowed brows. The woman didn't seem to notice his action as she continued her gentle ministrations. What was Yusaka to him? Why had it taken so long for this question to appear? She was. Well, she was certainly important to him. The woman had welcomed he and his team with open arms. She'd been incredibly accommodating with their situation in the shift of power they clearly presented to not only the yokai factions in Japan but as well as the Shinto pantheon as a whole. That was a conversation for another day and one he'd been avoiding for a while. It was just a giant headache and he'd rather put it off for as long as possible. Yusako was. Patient. Kind. Gentle. Beautiful in a way that should be absolutely illegal. 
she possessed an incredibly adorable child and while Naruto had been uncomfortable with the little Kyuubi's advances at first, she had certainly grew on him. Kuno was so precious and it was nearly impossible to not like her. The girl put on a front most of the times but he could sense emotions due to Kurama's innate ability. Kuno was a lonely child and he could certainly see why. Yusaka was usually gone for most of the day, stuck in meetings and dealing with the safety of all yokai in her district. The woman rarely had time for herself let alone her own daughter. But he'd seen the woman expertly juggle her time with Kuno and her work and while she was anything but perfect, she was trying. And that was something that Naruto resonated with. For someone who hadn't grown up with parents or any family for that matter, it was something he'd have wanted from a parent. Meeting his father during his initial fight with pain had been a brief one and while brief, Naruto had seen the man as who he was. Minato had damned him to a life of pain, even if unintentionally, but had believed in him from the start, and while Naruto had eventually forgiven his father for the life he'd been dealt, he hadn't known the love of a father until officially meeting the man during the war. He had come to understand his father as he fought alongside him against Obito and Madara. The hardest choices are often the most painful and Naruto had always wanted to be acknowledged and loved for him. Not for his actions, not for his power, for him. Yusaka exhibited these actions as well but it was slightly different. There was certainly an attraction to power and status but she'd been interested in who he was rather than what he did. Naruto knew, to some degree at least, that the love of a father and a mother was different compared to that of a partner. He hadn't been shown either up until the later stages of his life and even then, they'd been fleeting. The blonde teen had remembered Hanada's words during his battle with pain and even then had been hard pressed to believe that someone out there felt that way about him. He'd grown up believing that he'd been put in this world to be hated, to be ridiculed and to be spit on. To think that there would be someone, people that believed otherwise was difficult to come to terms with. Naruto had been treated poorly his entire life and to suddenly be accepted because of his actions was a hard pill to verbally swallow. It was definitely bittersweet. For an entire populace who cursed his being being to suddenly welcome him with open arms because of his feats was. It was annoying. He'd always been a good person at heart. While he certainly had his more childish moments as a kid and a shinobi, he'd always done his best to see the bright side. To always see the cup as half full instead of empty. To always persevere when faced with hardship. Perhaps that's why he couldn't truly accept, or rather return, the emotions that Yusaka subconsciously emitted, he didn't truly understand how to process and deal with them. They weren't together but they kind of were. They'd been practically conjoined at the hip since the arrival and it was very clear that Yusaka wished to pursue and push their relationship further. It wasn't like he didn't want to do so but he just didn't really know how to. The woman also had a child. Sue him. It was a lot to take in and he was still a kid, to some degree. Just because he had been forced to mature faster than his peers meant little in the grand scheme of relationships. Naruto sighed quietly to himself as he rubbed Yusaka's hand, returning the gentle gesture. His head hurt just thinking about this stuff and he really just wanted to sleep now. Too many old memories had just resurfaced and he found himself wanting. Yusaka's index finger tapped the back of his hand three times, forcing his attention. He met the woman's gaze and could see the concern swimming in her golden orbs. Naruto was tempted to assuage the woman's worries but thought better of it. He really just wanted to leave the room and head back to his personal quarters. Manifesting those old memories of his home and old friends cut deeper than he'd initially expected. The teen merely offered a sad smile as he shrugged his shoulders, prompting the woman to give an understanding nod. Yusaka rubbed his hand tenderly before subtly gesturing for him to leave the room. Naruto offered the woman a thankful smile as he gently grasped her hand, caressing the back of her hand with his thumb. After doing so, he stood to his feet before placing his hands into the pockets of his hoodie and leaving the room without another word, ignoring the whispers from the various yokai. After leaving the council chambers, Naruto slowly trudged his way through the large compound. He offered half-hearted nods and greetings to each yokai he passed as he continued to think of his home. He missed Konoha, the weather, the atmosphere, the smell. Naruto's eyes were downcast as he stepped through the door of his personal quarters. Darkness greeted him as he stood at the entrance, hands returning to the pockets of his hoodie. The nostalgia of opening his door to the black of his home resurfaced in his mind. No one to welcome him home. No aroma of delicious, home-cooked meals from a loving mother. No boisterous greeting from said woman. No gentle greeting from a father. It was just dark and quiet, so similar to his old home. The teen glanced around the dark room, easily scanning the large compound and making out the shapes of furniture and other necessities he owned. Naruto stood at the entrance for another few seconds before shaking his head quietly and eventually walking away, leaving the door to his compound open. Yusaka bid her counsel good night, seeing each yokai off individually. 
she was seated quietly for several seconds before sighing quietly and rubbing her eyes tiredly. The woman exhaled heavily for a moment before standing to her feet and exiting the room several minutes later. The yokai leader made her way through the large compound, greeting each and every yokai that passed by her. Several minutes passed by as she continued her journey to Naruto's personal quarters. Upon reaching the teen's personal compound, a small frown made its way to her face. Why was his door open? The woman reached the entrance of the boy's home, gazing into the darkness of his quarters with furrowed brows. Naruto? She called out quietly, hands resting upon the entrance to his home. Are you here? She waited a couple of seconds for a response before spreading her senses outwards. She blinked in confusion when she sensed the boy on the opposite side of the compound. The beautiful yokai closed Naruto's door before disappearing in a burst of speed, heading towards Naruto's position. It took the woman a minute or so for her to reach Naruto's position, her head tilted upwards, spotting the blonde-haired teen sitting upon the top of one of the various towers in the compound. Yusaka bent her knees before jumping towards the tower, silently landing on the platform with little trouble. Her golden orbs stared at the boy's back for a few moments before she began to make her way towards him. Her sandals quietly clacked upon the wooden platform as she sauntered towards the boy's situation. The yokai leader reached the boy's seated position before she plopped down beside him, close enough to touch with little issue but far enough for the boy to have his own personal space. A gentle breeze swept through the area, ruffling her hair. Yusaka resisted the urge to shiver as the cold bit through her clothes. The rustling of clothes drew her attention to her companion, noticing that the boy's hoodie was being pulled over his head. A gentle smile frames her face as the boy offered his hoodie to her. Yusaka nodded her head gratefully before pulling the larger hoodie over her body, shielding her from the cold. No words were spoken between the two as they basked in the silence of each other's presence. Usually Yusaka would strike up a conversation but at this moment she was content with the silence. She knew that something was bothering him, but she'd prefer if the boy voiced it himself. The minutes continued to pass in silence as Naruto's eyes were drawn to the full moon in the darkened sky. His fingers idly traced the various grooves in the wood as he contemplated something to say. Sighing quietly to himself, Naruto's left hand came to the back of his neck as he spoke quietly. It's a, it's a nice night, huh? Well, that was rather lame wasn't it? Yusaka's eyes cut to the boy for a moment before returning to the darkened sky, illuminated by the thousands of stars in the sky. It is rather beautiful, no? Yusaka agreed with a small smile. The Jubi Jinchiriki placed his hand back at his side, gripping the edge of the platform. So, how was the meeting? Anything important happened after I left? The woman sighed quietly as she shook her head, tails idly swaying to and fro. Not particularly, no though, plenty of questions about your sudden disappearance. Naruto glances at the Kayubi for a moment before averting his gaze and staring at the various compounds and homes below him. He contemplated his words for a few seconds before shrugging quietly. Just. Got lost in my head. He shook his head as if trying to convince himself. I'm fine now. I don't think so. Yusaka quietly disagreed. When the boy's gaze fell upon her, she continued. You've been distressed recently. You wear your emotions on your sleeve, Naruto. Are you doing well mentally? Golden orbs met Cerulean as both blondes stared into each other's eyes. They maintained contact for nearly an entire minute before Naruto abruptly averted his gaze. Uh. No, not really. He finally spoke, tone quiet and despondent. I miss my home. And my friends. His eyes narrowed sadly as he dipped his head. I had thought that I came to terms with it a long time ago but. Trailing off silently, Naruto sighed quietly. When Sasuke and I failed to reverse the jutsu, I continued to hold on to hope. Desperately believing that one day we'd find a way to save everyone. A bitter laugh escaped the teen as his hands gripped the wood beneath him tightly. Six months of anger, sadness, and hope. If it wasn't one thing it was another. I fought with Sasuke and placed the blame on him, trying to convince myself that what had happened wasn't my fault. I blamed myself. Even if it was completely unnecessary and totally out of my control, I thought that if I had handled things differently then the elemental nations would still be here. Naruto shook his head as he closed his eyes. Everything that happened was out of my control and I know this but I just can't accept it. I'm angry every single day. But what does being angry solve? It does nothing for me but is it wrong of me though, to feel this anger? Naruto's fingernails dug into the wood, carving the hardened material as he glared out into the distance. I saved my world. I defeated a fucking goddess. I defeated Sasuke and practically forced him to turn a new leaf. And then I still. His voice cracked as his emotions began to overwhelm him. Tears built in his eyes and he grit his teeth, nearly cracking his molars. I still get punished. I sacrificed my life for the world and what do I get in return? 
Naruto's hands crushed the wood beneath him, rendering the material to dust. His fists clenched tightly as dust particles slipped through his fingers. Everyone I've ever loved and held dear to my heart. They're gone. My world ceased to exist and with it, my dreams. His tone was full of venom as he stared at nothing in particular. I was cursed at birth and even now it seems that no matter how hard I try, I always end up losing. The silence afterwards was deafening. Naruto belatedly realized that he was panting heavily. He closed his eyes, willing his anger away. He nearly jumped as Yusaka's hand made purchase against his own. The woman's fingers threaded through his own as she clenched her hand shut, his own following suit. I can't begin to even understand the pain you feel Naruto. She spoke softly, forcing the boy's gaze upon her. Her golden orbs met his blue ones as she squeezed his hand. There is nothing wrong with being angry. No one can fault you for it. You've suffered so much and a lesser man would have crumbled. You're strong, Naruto. Yusaka squeezed the boy's hand once more before leaning her head on the boy's shoulder. I might not understand your pain but my ear is always open. I'll be here for you, I promise you that. Naruto stares down at the woman, words failing to form for several long seconds. Eventually he settled on accepting her words and closed his eyes, leaning his own head atop the woman's. A stray tear slowly crept its way down Naruto's face as he squeezed Yusaka's hand. The elemental nations may be gone. And with it, the memories of his friends and loved ones, but he had never given up before and he'd not do so now. He would forever cherish his loved ones and his home but Japan was his home now. He couldn't give up now. Not when he had something to truly fight for and protect again. Naruto squeezed Yusaka's hand tightly one last time, silently vowing to protect her and his new home. Sakura's eyes abruptly snapped open, body shooting straight up to a sitting position. Sweat cascaded down her body as her chest rose and fell with reckless abandon. Her eyebrows furrowed in confusion when she noticed the area she was in. An endless plain of land stretched before her and seemed to travel as far as her eyes could see. She blinked several times at the sight before glancing towards the sky. A frown framed her face as she stared out into the sky. Instead of a regular-looking sky she was greeted to the sight of a purplish-blue sky. There were several blotches of various other colors in the sky and the longer she looked, the stranger it got. What? Where the hell am I? She questioned quietly to herself, not expecting a response. We are in your mind. At least I believe that to be the case. What she didn't expect was a response, let alone one that carried such a deep baritone. The medic turned towards the voice before her eyes widened to saucers. That is a big dragon. Standing, or rather hovering, behind her was a gargantuan red dragon with a long neck and dark, green eyes not unlike her own. Various red and golden spikes jutted outwards from the dragon's body. That that's a dragon. What in the fuck was happening? W-H-O the hell are you? Sakura screamed out while adopting a fighter's stance. Her chakra proceeded to explode outwards as her seal released, saturating the area with her power. Several dark seals stretched along her body, giving her an exotic look as she adopted a fierce expression. If this dragon wanted a fight then she'd give it one, regardless of how strong it was. Mama didn't raise no bitch. Well, she technically did but semantics weren't important right now. It was fight time now baby. The giant dragon stared down at Sakura, green eyes sizing the woman up before a deep rumbling noise emitted from its body. Sakura tilted her head with narrowed eyes before speaking. Are you? You're laughing at me aren't you? The girl's eyebrow twitched as she yelled out. Stop laughing at me. I'll beat your ass. The red dragon seemed to only laugh louder at the pink-haired medic. It threw its giant head backwards, puffing out its body even more as it responded. I like you. I think we'll get along just fine, partner. The words brought Sakura up short. Her face contorted in confusion before she tilted her head. Partner. She questioned confusingly. What are you talking about? Who even are you? And what the hell are doing in my mind? The giant dragon paused for a moment before it slowly dropped to the ground, shaking the land as it did so. Its wings unfurled for a moment, enlarging the beast for a moment before it placed its appendages on the ground. Where are my manners? I have many names child. I am one of the two heavenly dragons, Diedrig. Though, most of this world knows me as the Welsh dragon. I have also gone by Y. Diedrig Gok and the Red Dragon Emperor. I despise being called the Red Dragon Emperor of Domination, though. Sakura blinked several times at the introduction before her eyes widened greatly. Wait a minute. You're the dragon in the boosted gauntlet, she exclaimed in surprise. Diedrig proceeded to nod its giant head at the question. I am indeed that dragon. It trailed off silently emerald orbs staring directly into Sakura's own. The medic was silent for a few moments before deactivating her seal and loosening her stance. Uh. My name's Sakura Haruno. It's nice to. To meet you. 
she questioned rather than stated, still confused as to why the boosted gauntlet dragon was in her head. If this was a dream, she'd very much like to wake up now. Likewise, partner. The dragon responded simply, nodding its large head. Sakura opened her mouth to speak before abruptly closing it. She was silent for several moments before exhaling heavily and hanging her head. I have a sacred gear now, don't I? That is correct, partner. Diedrich affirmed. Sakura sighed heavily once more before rubbing her eyes with her index and thumb. That kid I saved. He possessed a sacred gear didn't he? Correct. And that sacred gear was you? You are very intelligent. Sakura was half tempted to throw a punch at the dragon. She couldn't tell if it was being a smart ass or not. The medic continued to rub her eyes before rolling her neck, popping the joints. She rubbed her face with both hands as she took in the information she had, what little of it she possessed at least. I need a fucking drink. Where are we going, Papa? Nine fluffy tails idly swayed back and forth as Kuno stared up at Naruto, an adorable smile painted on her face. Papa. He still wasn't quite used to that word yet. It carried such a foreboding feel to it, and he didn't truly know why either. He never had a father growing up and taking the role as one, especially at such a young age, was daunting and quite terrifying. Pushing those negative thoughts and fears to the back of his mind, Naruto offered the girl a small smile. We are going to do a little shopping. Yusaka tells me you need supplies for your schoolwork? He knew that the woman could have had a servant do this but she was certainly pushing that father role onto him. Not that he minded or anything. Kuno was a precious little thing and he'd protect her. The twelve-year-old scrunched up her face at the mention of school. Bleg, school isn't fun. Naruto wholeheartedly agreed with that sentiment. He had hated the academy growing up and most of it stemmed from the neglect he received and the actual sabotaging of his academic learning. Nodding his head and holding his hand out for the girl to grab, he replied, I didn't like school either but it's important Kuno-chan. When the girl groaned quietly, he chuckled lightly. Tell you what, if you ace your project then I'll treat you to ice cream. How does that sound? Kunu's golden eyes practically shone like the sun as she jumped up and down, tails flailing about in an excited manner. You promise? Naruto gripped the girl's smaller hand in his larger one before replying with a small smile. Pinky promise. His other hand rose towards the girl as he stuck out his digit for the girl to reciprocate said action. You're the best, Papa, she exclaimed happily, locking her own pinky around his. Naruto's cerulean orb softened as he stared at the young Kyubi. A warm feeling spread throughout his body as the girl proceeded to hug him. He may have his reservations about that particular term and the role needed to fulfill it but, he'd do his damnedest to be the father that he never had. Squeezing the girl's hand in his own, he turned towards the large gates of Yusaka's compound. Onward, he shouted with a large smile that was mimicked by the adorable Kyubi at his side. Yai, Marcus Black was not a good man. Such was the life of a cruel and accomplished assassin. He had slain thousands and walked upon mountains of corpses to get to where he was at. Armed with a unique and heavily coveted power, he was a dangerous individual to fight against. Even more so when money was on the line. He had crossed his suppliers plenty of times and cared not for the bodies that lay at his feet. Killing was a skill. One that he was intimate with. Marcus had grew up in the mud. From a young, starving child to a conniving, evil man. He had been born and raised in sin. He had drew his first blood at the tender age of seven and had swam through an ocean of blood following his upbringing. Instinct. Brutality. Cruelness. Paranoia. They all mixed together to create the abomination that walked through the streets of Kyoto. Beady eyes swept through the crowds of unknowing humans and ignorant yokai. Marcus Black was an assassin. One that enjoyed his job wholeheartedly. The rush of a kill was matched by no other high. The more high profile the target, the better the high. Marcus adjusted his black vest right hand gliding over one of his various pockets and pulling out a retractable knife. The man unfurled the unique looking blade, spinning it through his fingers before retracting it. High profile targets generated quite the amount of money, and while he cared little for the materialistic things in life, he knew that money talked. So when a document landed upon his doorstep with the image a young yokai who possessed nine fox tails, who was he to pass up the chance to kill off one of the yokai faction leader's daughter? The young Kyubi's protection detail had been relatively lax as of lately and Marcus cared little as to why that was the case. He was Marcus Black. One of the most ruthless and well-known assassins to exist in the United States. What would a couple of second-rate yokai do to him? His power nullified others and each individual he killed with a unique power was harvested as his own. With a sea of bodies at his feet, he had collected a plethora of useful and powerful abilities. The white-haired assassin weaved through the crowds of people and yokai alike with little issue his presence practically non-existent, 
his beady eyes locked onto the tiny Kayubi yokai as she walked hand in hand with a blonde man that possessed whiskers upon his cheeks. Had Yusaka's husband finally returned? The lad seemed to be on the younger side though. Marcus thought nothing of it as the blonde man led the younger girl into a store. The assassin stared at the entrance before completely disappearing from sight, his presence vanishing completely. The man followed after the duo, weaving his way around the lingering bystanders, he watched as the blonde man rummaged through various aisles, hand in hand with the young girl, searching for specific objects. Marcus flicked his trusty knife into his hand as he slowly stalked towards the young Kayubi, his beady eyes narrowed on the girl as he took slow and measured steps towards her. It would be a relatively simple kill, a clean cut through the girl's throat and she'd be dead within seconds. Marcus could just imagine the look of despair and pain upon Yusaka's face as she heard the news of her daughter's gruesome death. The assassin silently crept up to the girl's position completely undetected, his wrist rotated and his arm shot out towards the girl's throat, intent on gouging through the flesh. Many things happened during that single second. The first was the fact that his knife didn't cut through flesh. The second was the ironclad grip that prevented him from moving. The third was the blank look that he was receiving from the blonde man, despite having completely erased his presence. How? Oi. The blonde man spoke in a blank tone as his hand squeezed Marcus's arm tightly, producing a disgusting crunching noise as the man's bones were viciously grinded together. What do you think you're doing? Marcus withheld the urge to grunt in pain as the man's grip increased nearly tenfold. He immediately tried to pull away but was shocked when his arm was wrenched out of its socket. A grotesque popping sound filled the air as he stumbled backwards. Fuck. He eventually swore in pain, his form shimmering brightly before reappearing for all to see. Marcus's ebony eyes finally deigned to rise towards the blonde man and when they centered on the man's eyes. What? What is this? Feeling. Vermilion, slitted pupils stared into the confines of Marcus's very soul. Emotions that Marcus had thought he had killed and buried long ago resurfaced with a vengeance, spreading through his veins like liquid fire. The assassin's adrenaline surged as his fight or flight activated, and right now? Flight. He needed to get away, away from this monster. He'd be killed. No 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 no. Marcus tried to pull away once more and before he could even hope to move his foot, he was rooted in place by the man's chakra. A mountain proceeded to drop atop his shoulders, leaving him gasping and struggling to breathe. Marcus was forced to kneel as the monster before him tilted his head. The scenery around them changed in an instant. No longer were they in the store. Yusaka's child was nowhere to be found as he was alone with the monster before him. Marcus's eyes widened in fear as a gargantuan shadow proceeded to loom over the blonde man. Its towering form flickered for a brief moment and Marcus glimpsed matted, red fur. What do we have here? A booming voice resounded through the pitch black chamber as the water beneath his feet swayed back and forth violently. Marcus's eyes moved away from the blonde monster in front of him before practically freezing at the sight of the looming beast in front of him. Twin orbs of scarlet stared down at him, framed by a mountain-sized head. Dozens upon dozens of rows of serrated teeth sat in the creature's mouth, its face pulled back in a terrifying snarl. Marcus's blood ran cold as the titanic beast continued to stroll towards his position, its lumbering movement causing vicious tremors to shake the area. With each step the beast took was another step that cemented Marcus's doom. I've, I've made an egregious mistake, I need to escape. With those thoughts circulating through his core, Marcus jumped to his feet before fleeing from the man and beast as fast as he could. Gotta get away, gotta run, can't look back, run little pig, run, run, run like the vermin you are. The titanic nine-tailed fox roared loudly, shaking the area. You can't escape. The beast proceeded to cackle, its menacing voice reverberating off the walls of the sewer. I will find you Marcus Black. And when I do, I will flay your skin from your bones. Ah ha 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 ha. Marcus ignored the beast's words as desperation and fear surged through his body. Survival was the only thing on his mind. He had to get out. He had to leave. Little did Marcus know. He was already dead. Papa. Naruto's crimson orbs traveled away from the comatose assassin before settling on the little Kayubi. His eyebrows furrowed in slight confusion when Kunu's head tilted in a curious manner. Your eyes are red, she replied in a simplistic manner, they look nice. His eyes were red? Ah. Kurama must have been angry. It had been an awfully long time since Kurama's influence had been allowed to bleed through. I'm angry? The beast snorted derisively. Look in the mirror, mongrel. Shut up. He responded childishly. The blonde Jinchuriki closed his eyes for the briefest moments before slowly opening them and fixating a smile on his face. It was an incredibly strained smile and Naruto was having a rather tough time trying to control his growing bloodlust. 
Kurama's chakra was practically bubbling at the surface. Thank you, Kuno-chan. He responded stiffly as a shadow clone popped into existence beside him. I have something that I need to handle now. It'll be quick so don't give me that look. Kunu's frown only grew deeper as the shadow clone gently took her hand before leading her away. I don't wanna. The shadow clone, wisely, interjected with a smile. Do you want ice cream? Yes. The little Kyubi responded almost instantaneously. Then let's get some ice cream. The doppelganger responded simply with a smile. Its eyes left the girl for all but a few seconds, zeroing in on its creator and nodding its head. Naruto watched his shadow clone lead the little yokai out of the store. When he was certain that they were gone, his attention shifted towards the assassin as his eyes bled red once more. Let's talk. Naruto's right hand descended upon the man's throat as red chakra sprang to life on his appendage. The two men proceeded to disappear in a yellow flash. Sasuke's bottom lip twitched for a moment, concentration lapsing for the briefest of seconds as the feeling of Naruto's chakra washed over Kyoto. It was brief, fleeting even, but it had most certainly happened. A disturbing feeling if he was being honest. Naruto seldomly allowed himself to get angry. Even less so, allowing his anger to consume him. He'd only felt the boy's true wrath a handful of times. Sasuke could literally count the number of times Naruto allowed his anger to control him on one hand. Something was clearly wrong. Sasuke released a quiet sigh as his eyes slowly opened. His gaze slowly traveled towards his female companion, who was currently seated with her hands on her knees, before speaking. Expect company. Kuroka's nose twitched cutely as she tilted her head, cat ears twitching towards the sound of his voice. The Nekosho slowly opened her eyes with a confused gaze, practically asking why. Someone is, angry. Sasuke mentioned rather than explained. You have not formally met Naruto, have you? Kuroka's legs slowly unfurled from beneath her, knees popping quietly due to the position they'd been in for the past several hours. Ooh, I finally get to meet your best friend, NYA. She questioned rather excitedly, tails swaying side to side in an exaggerated manner. Sasuke said nothing but dipped his head in agreement. Why is he ko? Whatever Kuroka was about to say was cut off as the individual they had been speaking about appeared before their very eyes. And with his appearance followed the weight of his chakra. A chakra so heavy and angry that Kuroka nearly gagged on the spot. Vile, disgusting and angry. Hatred multiplied on a scale that would make a devil green with envy. Kuroka stared at the man with something akin to fear. Eyes wide in horror, the man's eyes practically peered into her very soul. This, this was Naruto, the man that Sasuke had told her about. This was no man. His animalistic eyes traveled towards her and Kuroka felt her heart practically stop. Caught in the gaze of an apex predator with nowhere to run. She truly believed that she was going to die. Until he spoke, that is. Ah, he spoke with what appeared to be an apologetic expression on his face, though it was hard to tell due to the animalistic features upon his face. I'm sorry, I'm a little angry right now. The blonde teen closed his eyes and the transition was instant. The all-encompassing anger and rage disappeared, smothered by a calming and relaxing aura. His animalistic features tapered off and in its place was a rather normal, albeit handsome face with cute whiskers. Who is that? Sasuke questioned with narrowed eyes, dual orbs focusing on the catatonic man lying on the floor. Kuroka blinked several times as her eyes shifted towards the man in question. She hadn't even noticed that. What the hell? Granted. She did believe that she was about to be killed one could forgive her. Naruto glanced at his friend before nudging the comatose assassin with his feet. This is an assassin who's currently feeling the wrath of Kurama. A harsh kick to the ribs flipped the man over, revealing his unassuming features. His target was Kuno. The Uchiha took a single cursory glance at the assassin, ignoring Kuroka's curious gaze and spoke with a raised eyebrow. And you want answers. A single nod was Naruto's response. Sasuke sighed quietly before slowly rising to his feet and gesturing for Kuroka to do the same. I'll handle it, and in the meantime, go be useful somewhere else and calm down. Everyone felt your anger. Naruto's eyes narrowed at his friend, watching as the Uchiha grasped the assassin by his collar, dragging him along the floor and into one of the various rooms of his apartment. So, you're this, Naruto, I keep hearing about, NYA. Cerulean orbs shifted to the cat yokai in the room, assessing the woman with a calculative expression. Several seconds of silence reigned in the room before Naruto offered the girl a smile. You're a good influence on the prick. The snort of laughter that escaped Kuroka caused Naruto's smile to grow more genuine. Oh wow, I was not expecting that. Another giggle left the Nekosho as she continued. It is nice to meet you, Uzumaki-kun. 
Sasuke-kun has told me a lot about you. The tension in Naruto's shoulders began to slowly evaporate as he raised at an eyebrow at the woman. Just call me Naruto please. No need for formalities. And I can only assume that you are the infamous rogue devil yokai, Kuroka. The yokai sketched a rather amused now, left arm flourishing as she did so. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. Well, a pause. It was nice meeting you, Kuroka. I'm going to speak with Yusaka. I'll be seeing you around. The Nekoshu's expression wavered for a moment before Kuroka offered a simple nod and goodbye. Naruto nodded his head in acknowledgement before glancing towards the room that Sasuke taken Marcus to. His expression slowly shifted, becoming something ugly as he began to make his way out of the room. Whoever sent that man, would regret it. Sakura awoke with a small gasp, sweat dripping down her face as her heart thundered furiously in her chest. Tuna. The medic subconsciously reacted to the voice and lashed out with a fist. Her fist was dodged, if only barely, by the man who had spoken. Tuna mayonnaise. The high-collared man spouted as he backed a few feet away from the woman. Sakura's emerald orb slowly focused as she glanced around the room. Her eyes briefly scrutinized the white-haired man before darting around the rather spartan room. What happened? A brief spike of pain emanated from her head forcing her eyes closed. Chakra surged in her hands, a green glow illuminating the rather dark room as she placed her fingers on her temples. As she massaged her temples, several memories began floating towards her. A barrier-like dome, some bat-winged cosplaying hooker with a light spear, a dead teenager, and a ginormous red dragon. Ah yes, it was all coming back to her. Dot dot dot, I need a drink. A quiet groan passed through her lips as her headache dulled to a minor throb. A sigh and then, thank you, Inamaki-san. The whited-haired man gestured lazily with his hand before pulling a piece of paper out of his front pocket and handing it to her. Sakura's eyebrows furrowed in confusion as her eyes slowly roamed along the parchment. Why? Odd. Emerald orbs rose from the parchment, centering on the young man before her. How long have you been scouting Kuo? Toge shrugged his shoulders, signing with his hands on the exact amount of days he'd been stationed in Kuo. Three months. Three months. At his nod Sakura glanced back down at the paper. And you're absolutely positive about this. Toge nodded his head firmly followed by a single word. Tuna. Sakura pursed her lips before glancing back towards the man. Why didn't you inform your superior? Or even make contact with Yusaka-sama? Sakura was bemused to see a splotch of red take over the boy's cheeks. As if embarrassed by the question, Toge signed slowly with his hands. I, I forgot. Yuji-kun and his team are busy searching for the remaining artifacts and Maki-san and Panda are in Tokyo following a lead. I've been swamped with work. The medic snorted quietly as she folded the paper up and placed it in her pocket. Well then, I'll relieve you of your duty. Make sure that Yusaka-sama is informed about what you've found. It isn't a coincidence that those fallen angels are here. The white-haired teen saluted the medic before tilting his head and signing a question. Are you going to be okay? Sakura smiled at the boy's concern as she answered. I'll be fine, Inamaki-san. Just know that the Shinto pantheon has both of the heavenly dragons in their possession now. A smirk overtook her features as Toge's eyes widened in surprise. We have divine dividing and the boosted gear. At Sakura's nod the boy tilted his head, slowly signing with his hand. You, have one. Sakura winked in response. Toge said nothing in response, too shocked by the revelation that the yokai faction, and by proxy the Shinto pantheon, now was in possession of two of the strongest sacred gears in existence. And one of them was right here in front of him. Don't you have a report to give? Sakura asked in an amused tone. Get moving Inamaki-kun. A dash of red spread through the boy's features as he bid a farewell to his superior. Hi, I'll be seeing you around Sakura-sama. Toge disappeared in a burst of speed before Sakura could even hope to curb his formal title. Why does everyone call me that? Your leader holds you and your team in high regards does she not? You should get used to it, partner. Quiet you overgrown lizard. A small frown marred Sasuke's face as his Mangeku Sharingan slowly deactivated. His ebony orb regarded the catatonic assassin with a minor look of disdain. This information was, annoying. Whether it was true or not was up for debate but it was most certainly going to cause trouble in Yusaka's inner circle. Again, it mattered little if the information he extracted from Marcus was true or not. The fact he had been paid to eliminate Yusaka's daughter was troubling in itself. One does not callously order such actions nor would one do so without covering their tracks. Except, it had happened. Marcus has been contracted with the sole purpose of eliminating Kuno. He had been paid a hefty amount to do so as well. 
nearly 50 million United States dollars to do so. That single fact was already out of the ordinary considering Marcus Black was an infamous assassin in the Euro-Asian areas of the world. It wasn't completely out of the ordinary considering the fact that the man himself was American and it would only be normal that his payment be dealt in American currency. But it merited suspicion due to the fact that Marcus hadn't actually stepped into U.S. soil for the last five years. He had been in Tokyo the last two years, completing various contracts and missions. Three years before that he had been in Russia, going undercover shadowing over various factions that were causing trouble and eliminating some big fish while he was at it. Odd. Odd indeed. Disregarding the currency as something merely being coincidental, which Sasuke disbelieved in regardless due to his tenure as a shinobi, an actual name had been given from his contract. A name that was very familiar all things considered. Yuiho Suzume. The Tokyo billionaire that Kakashi had assassinated a week or so ago. He had unknowingly trafficked two young yokais who so happened to be related to one of Yusaka's inner council members. Now, why was it odd? Well, dead men tell no tales. Yuiho was a man that had been unaware of the supernatural world. Whether that statement was true or not really didn't matter to you. Why? Because as far as Kakashi was concerned, Yuiho only dealt with drug trafficking and prostitution. And Sasuke wholeheartedly believed in Kakashi's information gathering skills so that was a mute point. The billionaire man had never dipped his toes in the assassination business and that's what truly stood out for Sasuke. A billionaire he was but a moron he was not. The hitman business was a tricky and dangerous business. One does not meddle with vipers and cobras and expect to not be bitten. So that begged the question, why would Yuiho, if he had even done so, target Yusaka's child? A woman who he had little to zero knowledge of. A woman that would have flown completely under Yuiho's radar. More so, how would Yuiho have known that Yusaka had a child to begin with? How would he have known that Kunu's bodyguards had been slowly relieved of their duty due to Naruto's sudden appearance? It wasn't like Yusaka was a celebrity, flaunting her image and plastering it on billboards for all to see. The woman preferred to keep to herself and while she treated the entirety of the yokai faction as her own family, it had always felt like she kept them at arm's reach. Which didn't surprise Sasuke all that much considering how politics worked. Nasty business and whatnot. Nothing added up and it only pointed to someone being careless and not bothering to cover their tracks. Had he not been a shinobi with years of training in subterfuge, he'd have merely glanced over this small fact, assuming Yuio was wealthy enough and had enough pull in Japan to be aware of the supernatural. It wasn't completely unheard of for wealthy and influential billionaires to be aware of the supernatural world. Individuals such as Bill Gates and Elon Musk were of the few individuals with this knowledge. At least those were the ones that Sasuke was aware of, but that was neither here nor there. It was obvious, not really, that something was wrong. And Sasuke was just going to assume that someone close to Yusaka had ordered the hit. After all, how else would an infamous assassin breach through Kyoto's barrier without alerting the dozens of yokai that monitored the signatures of individuals coming in and out of the city? The yokai barrier team was incredibly meticulous and considering that Naruto had offered his help in making the barrier even stronger just led credence to his belief that someone close to Yusaka was the culprit. A low sigh escaped Sasuke as he rubbed the bridge of his nose. Naruto was not going to take this information well. Sasuke pulsed his chakra in a familiar pattern, alerting Naruto that he was ready to speak to him. Before the team could even react, Naruto seemed to just appear at his side. Even after having seen the boy and his father use the technique, Sasuke was still unnerved by the Hiroishin. Naruto could have attacked him and he'd be defenseless against it. It was just too fast to even react to. Even Madara had fell victim to the Hiroishin's instantaneous travel and that man had had every biju in his body. Ignoring the instinct and urge to attack Naruto purely off of reflex, Sasuke turned his head to stare at his friend. You might want to sit down. The ground beneath Naruto's feet lurched as a makeshift dune of mud and soil formed under him. The Jinchuriki slowly sat down on the mud wall, ignoring Sasuke's annoyed expression. Annoying prick. Sasuke muttered quietly, knowing well that Naruto had heard him. I've come to my own conclusion regarding why Kuno was targeted, and you won't like it. Naruto said nothing, only raising his eyebrow in acknowledgement. There's a rat in that circle. Sasuke noted that Naruto's features tightened. Nothing more, nothing less. That wasn't necessarily the reaction he had been expecting. Naruto wore his emotions on his sleeve. He was very in tune with his emotions and was normally incredibly easy to read. Do you have any clues as to who? Naruto questioned quietly, eyes firmly fixated on Marcus's unconscious body. None. Naruto pursed his lips for a moment, eyes briefly bleeding crimson. I'll be handling it. 
The blonde teen slowly fell from atop his mud wall, landing softly beside Sasuke. Anything else? He asked quietly. Sasuke was tempted to question why his friend was behaving differently but chose better. This was the first time he was seeing this side of Naruto. Sasuke doubted that Naruto wasn't angry. He knew his friend and knew him well. Other than locations, various targets and other smaller contracts. No. The Jinchuriki nodded his head before taking a step towards Marcus's unconscious body. He stared at the comatose man before slowly raising his right hand and extending his index finger. Red viscous chakra slowly bubbled along Naruto's arm, traveling towards his index finger. The chakra engulfed his appendage causing his fingernails to sharpen and extend in length. Sasuke had yet to actually see Naruto kill someone. For as long as he knew the boy, he had never heard of or seen the boy take a life. Sasuke assumed that Naruto hadn't the stomach or will to commit such a heinous act. He was proven wrong nearly a second later as Naruto's index finger pierced Marcus's forehead, sinking deep into his skull with a wet squelching sound. Kakashi observed the individuals in Yusaka's council chambers with a disinterested gaze. His trusty, new, hentai manga was clutched in his left hand, erotic scenes ignored for the time being. Rarely would he ever choose to ignore his erotica but this was important. Sasuke had deduced the perpetrator behind Marcus's contract. Well, not necessarily but close enough. According to Sasuke, Naruto was going to handle it, which could mean a plethora of things. Sasuke had informed him that his favorite troublemaker had finally taken a life. It honestly surprised Kakashi. Naruto had never verbally stated his disposition on those who take lives, they were shinobi after all, but he had also never done the deed himself. One could argue that Naruto had killed Kakazu, but they'd be wrong considering he himself had ended Kakazu after the man had been severely injured by Naruto's imperfect Rasenshuriken. White Zetsu didn't necessarily count even if they had been human at one point though that was a debate all in itself. Naruto had never truly taken a human life during his tenure as a shinobi, choosing instead to use his words to his advantage. Force was obviously used when needed, like Obito and Pain for example, but he hadn't killed those men either. His student had finally taken a life. A measure of pride and guilt tugged at Kakashi's heart due to it. He was proud that Naruto was capable of a more direct approach to those who would harm the people he cares about but. Naruto was like a little brother to Kakashi. He heavily slacked on his duties as a teacher and that blame was placed firmly on his shoulders but it still didn't feel right to him. A low sigh escaped Kakashi as his eyes stared at his manga, ignoring the erotic scenes due to his thoughts. His feelings didn't matter because at the end of the day Naruto would do what he believed was right and make no mistake, Naruto was a good kid with a good head on his shoulders. Kakashi would follow Naruto to hell and back and all the boy would have to do was ask. But as the boy's self-imposed big brother, Kakashi would have a chat with the boy when this was all over. Talking a human life was not something anyone could do. The minutes continued to drift on as Kakashi lost himself to his thoughts. The minutes turned into an hour as the room slowly filled with Yusaka's inner council members. Naruto had requested his presence in the room and Kakashi had an inkling as to what his troublemaking student would do. After another 30 or so minutes, Naruto entered the room with Yusaka only half a step behind. Unlike other times when they'd enter the room with one another, Naruto was leading Yusaka instead of the other way around. Peculiar but not outlandish, the room quieted as each individual took their seats, back straight and eyes focused on Yusaka along with Naruto. Kakashi's ebony orb swept through the room, focusing on each individual and searching for any micro-expressions and or subtle twitches. Finding nothing that would incriminate and or pinpoint the rat in the room, Kakashi pocketed his book and stood to his full height. As you may or may not know, several hours ago my daughter was targeted by an assassin. Yusaka stated firmly, slowly taking a seat towards the end of the table. The attempt failed and the assassin has been dealt with. Silence greeted her statement, not entirely surprising considering what had happened. Some were shocked to find out and others seemed concerned. I am no stranger to this game myself. But my child was targeted. The woman's face tightened angrily, sharp teeth barring for the briefest of moments as she locked eyes with every single individual in the room. I have been nothing but patient and kind during my tenure as a yokai faction leader. I put the need of my people ahead of my own ambitions. Of my own feelings. Of my own time. Yusaka's right hand slowly descended upon the mahogany table, fingernails tapping rhythmically against the aged wood. I am disgusted by the actions of those who would wish to hurt me, targeting my own child. My own flesh and blood. She snarled angrily as her chakra shook the room, voice raising several octaves. And the one responsible is seated in this very room. 
following her outburst was her fist descending directly through the table, shattering it like glass. Wood chippings exploded throughout the room followed by several exclamations of surprise and shock. Silence. Yusaka roared angrily, golden tail swaying erratically in the air. The coward who would betray my trust and target the one thing I love more than anything will pay. The Kayubi stood to her feet, chakra weighing down each individual in the room as she exerted her presence. I shall give you one chance to admit to your treachery. Your punishment will be lenient if you come forth and expose yourself. Silence. Whether that be out of fear, shock, and or guilt was up in the air. After several seconds of silence the yokai leader snarled angrily. Have it your way then. Turning her head towards Naruto, she gestured quietly. You may begin, Naruto. The aforementioned team glanced towards the irate woman, offering her a brief nod. Cerulean orbs met Kakashi's ebony orbs and a silent message was conveyed. One that Kakashi instantly understood. The Jonin's gloved hand made contact with the wall behind him. A brief flare of chakra alerted everyone to Kakashi. When the room's occupants turned their attention on the man they were surprised to see several kanji and what looked like a barrier seal spread throughout the room. Can't have any of you leaving now can we? Kakashi asked rhetorically, amusement littering his tone. Well, you could try, but you wouldn't get that far. Naruto cleared his throat immediately after Kakashi's words. After gaining the attention of the room, Naruto gestured with his hand. We're going to play a simple game. I am going to ask each of you a question. You will answer it truthfully. Simple, right, let's begin. Naruto's gaze flicked towards the youngest yokai in the room. A single stride placed him in front of the woman who met his gaze and though she displayed a degree of anxiety and nervousness, she never strayed away from his eyes. The Jubi Jinchuriki raised his right hand towards the woman, displaying an open palm. I'm going to place my hand on your chest and ask you a question. Naruto placed his palm directly over where the woman's heart rested before staring into her eyes. His other hand slowly rose, palm splayed upward facing the ceiling. Yaoyorozu san, were you involved in the assassination contract that led Marcus Black to target Kuno? The woman's expression shifted in confusion for a brief moment as a wave of chakra swept through her body. Had she not been hyper-focused on every little detail about the man and his question then she might have missed the sensation. Her mane of wild and untamed hair shook as she answered. No, I did not. Cerulean gazed into charcoal for several seconds until. Okay. Naruto's palm vacated its place upon the woman's chest before he shifted his attention to a different individual. While many were confused about the process, others quietly murmured to one another. And so the blonde teen circled the room, asking the same question and repeating the same gesture with both hands to every individual in the room. When reaching the eighth individual in the room he asked once again. Yamaboko-san, were you involved in the assassination contract that led Marcus Black to target Kuno? The broad-shouldered yokai narrowed his eyes, staring into Naruto's cerulean orbs. What if I don't want to answer? What will you do then? His tone was one of genuine curiosity. Naruto was quiet for a moment before lazily shrugging his shoulder. Nothing, he answered rather bluntly. The older yokai tilted his head curiously before deigning a response to Naruto's previous question. No, I was not. Naruto stared into the man's eyes, slowly nodding his head. Why did you ask what I would do? Yamaboko merely tilted his head, pondering his answer. Curiosity, I suppose. A second turned to two. And two turned to ten. And then ten turned to a minute. Several of the elders began to quietly murmur amongst one another as Naruto's palm remained glued to Yamaboko's chest. Naruto's head tilted as he finally spoke over the tense silence. Was it this same curiosity that caused you to target Kuno? The teen raised a single eyebrow as he continued. Or do you wish to cause unnecessary conflict within the Shinto pantheon? The elder's eyes grew harsh as he responded. You dare accuse me of targeting a mere child for enjoyment? A wave or chakra rolled off the man as he snarled angrily. You question my loyalty to the Shinto pantheon, boy. Before Yamaboko could continue his angry rant, Naruto's chakra rolled off his body in waves, blanketing the room and shaking the entire building. Naruto's chakra caused the man's legs to buckle as he fell to the floor on both knees. Incandescent colors seemed to emanate from the very pores of Naruto's body, painting him in a brilliant cascade of bright colors. The pressure continued to grow and grow, shaking the foundation of the building to the point of near collapse. And when the building reached its near breaking point, it stopped. The pressure vacated. The thick smog of power evaporated. Naruto's eyes traveled downward to meet Yamaboko's terrified and odd expression. His left hand slowly traveled towards his face, index finger nearing his lips as he quietly hushed the man. 
Shish. Use your inside voice when speaking to me. Naruto's left hand slowly vacated away from his mouth. Bending his knee, Naruto sank down to Yamaboko's level, eyes never once leaving the man. You are a liar, Yamaboko. The Jinchuriki continued softly. I have the unique ability to sense negative emotions. I tend to dull this power given to me due to the influx of information from those around me. It does not feel good when hundreds of thousands of negative feelings, thoughts, and actions invade your mind at the same time every second of the day. Kyoto, Japan is my home. And threats to my home will be dealt with swiftly. I lost everything once before. I'm not going to risk that again. Ever. A yellow flash appeared in Naruto's left hand followed by a wet gurgling noise courtesy of Yamaboko. The palm that had been glued to Yamaboko's chest finally pulled away, revealing the Horishin mark. Naruto slowly rose to his feet before turning towards the rest of the room and holding out his left hand for all of the individuals to see. Let this be a warning to all of you. The yokai factions, be they the west, east, north and or south, are all under one banner, the Shinto pantheon. Naruto's eyes shifted to Yamaboko as he continued. Traitors have no place among us. Japan is our home. You don't destroy your homes, now do you. Let this action today be a reminder and a warning. The Jinchuriki slowly dropped the object he had taken from Yamaboko. The item fell to the floor in wet squelch, staining the wooden floors crimson. Yamaboko's breathing grew ragged and harsh as his vision began to slowly blacken. His eyes grew glassy as they focused on the object that Naruto had dropped near his feet. A wet wheeze escaped his lips as his right hand tried to reach for said object on the floor. Another wet cough caused his body to fall forward, head slamming into the hardwood floors. Yamaboko drew his last breath, dying in a pool of his own blood. His outstretched arm was merely inches away from the object that kept him alive. Fingers desperately seeking the organ that supplied with him life. The man's heart ceased to continue thumping, finally cementing Yamaboko's death. Avoiding the issue doesn't solve it, Naruto. He was half tempted to roll his eyes at Kurama's words. The only thing stopping Naruto from doing so was the fact that his partner was correct. It wasn't solving anything and at this point he was avoiding the talk off pure principle. So instead, he deflected and downplayed it. Want me to cry about it? Tell you all these conflicting emotions about what I've done? Is that what you want? He responded in a snarky manner. If Kurama was bothered by his words then the beast did little to show it. I want you to acknowledge it. The thin patience that Naruto had was on the cusp of being snapped. I already have. It isn't going to change anything. Again, Kurama did not seem phased by the boy's words. The fox's tone remained even as it responded. Could have fooled me. A pause. By all means, continue lying to yourself. I'm positive that's the best course of action. Anger blossomed once more in Naruto's chest and he oh so badly wished to lash out because of it. But then he'd just be proving Kurama's point. I'm not going to sit here and pester you about opening up. It isn't my job to do so. However, I will pester you when you are being an idiot. And right now, you are being one. Okay. Naruto snapped angrily. You know how I feel. I feel like shit. Cerulean orbs became slick with tears as he stared at the night sky from his vantage point atop the compound's largest tower. I took not one but two lives. Two. Who am I to decide who lives or dies? I'm not a fucking god. I'm not some omniscient being that decides someone's fate. So why the hell was I the one to make that decision? Shame and guilt tugged at Naruto's heart as his fingers clenched his pants. It makes me sick. I told myself that I wouldn't abuse my power. That I wouldn't become someone who would just take life so callously. And now look at me. Deciding who gets to die simply because I felt like it. Kurama listened to Naruto's words, silently contemplating what to say. This was by no means an area of expertise that the beast excelled in. Kurama was not a human and therefore believed that any matters regarding what mortals do and don't do, was not its business. Thankfully, the Kayubi did not have to do so. Is that why you're up here sulking? Kami, you haven't changed a bit. Still that naive, little child on the docks. Sasuke's monotonous voice resounded out beside the teen. Shut up you stupid bastard. Naruto immediately snapped in retaliation. His head snapped up towards Sasuke, pinning the teen with a vicious stare. I'm not like you. We don't think the same way. You may be fine with taking someone's life and not thinking about it but I can't do that. If the Uchiha was bothered by his friend's words then he did nothing to show it. Instead, the ebony-haired teen turned his attention out towards Kyoto. Who said you had to be fine with taking someone's life? Sasuke questioned quietly, briefly stunning Naruto. Those words never left my mouth. I called you naive because you are. 
but there is also nothing wrong with how you think. Sasuke slowly unsheathed his kusanagi, placing the flat end of the blade along his right palm. He gazed into the sword's reflection for a moment before continuing. You are naive because you believe everyone is capable of second chances. You give the benefit of the doubt no matter the individual. I'd even go as far as to say that you'd have even given Kagaya a second chance. When Naruto didn't retort his claim Sasuke nodded his head. However, not everyone is capable of being given a second chance. There are those in this world, and even our own one, that were not worthy of being given a second chance. You may disagree with me but it is an opinion, no matter how wrong it is. Many believe that you cannot judge others' opinions because they are just that, opinions. But I disagree. An opinion can also be outright stupid. Sasuke shifted the blade in his hand, placing it down his line of sight, staring down the weapon as if it were a rifle. An example is someone who would hold hate in their heart for another individual based solely off the color of their skin. They may try to justify their prejudices with stereotypical evidence and events but that does not change the fact that their way of thinking is idiotic. Sasuke glanced down at his friend, noticing that the teen's attention was centered directly on him. It was slightly unnerving to some degree. Usually Sasuke was the one listening to someone lecture him about life and perspective. How the turn tables, turn, or whatever the saying was. Take my Kusanagi for example. He raised the blade towards Naruto's direction. It is a double-edged blade, meaning no matter which way I decide to attack, I will injure whoever is on the other side of it. However, he trailed off before flipping the blade to show the flat end of the sword. I am also capable of using the flat end of the blade to render my enemies unconscious. They say to treat your blade as an extension of your own self. How you strike, where you strike and who you strike are all indicative of who you are as a person. The blade is capable of maiming and killing yes, but it is also capable of rendering someone unconscious. The Uchiha let his statement hang in the air for a couple of seconds before slowly sheathing the weapon. You are the same as any weapon, Naruto. The only difference between yourself and a blade is that you are capable of individual thought. And how you choose to use those thoughts, and actions, is entirely up to you. But in doing so, you must also realize that not everyone around you, including yourself, will be comfortable with the decisions you make. That is life. Silence reigned after Sasuke's long-winded speech and if he was being honest, it was kind to comfortable. He wasn't the most emotionally in-tuned individual but he could offer his own perspective and beliefs. He himself had taken plenty of lives and while not all of them were justified, it didn't mean that they didn't affect him. Sasuke's quest for vengeance and power had led him down a dark path and he had swam through a river of blood just to kill his elder brother. Looking back on who he used to be made Sasuke sick to his stomach at times. And if he was being completely honest, he didn't feel like he deserved a second chance at life. But his late night talks with Kuroka had helped ease that way of thinking. She was annoying and overly bubbly but he also found comfort in her presence. He was definitely aware of this and the potential consequences of what could happen regarding the woman, but that was a conversation for another time. One he wanted to avoid. So lost in his own thoughts he nearly missed when Naruto finally spoke. Thanks, Sasuke. The Jinchuriki sniffed quietly, rubbing his eyes to prevent the tears that wished to fall. You know, sometimes you can be helpful. Who would have thought? He chuckled lightheartedly after his words earning an annoyed scoff from Sasuke. Yeah yeah whatever, just don't be a dumbass anymore. Having said his piece Sasuke leapt down from atop the tower, landing without a sound. He took a few steps before stopping in his tracks and turning his head towards one of the various dark corners. Kakashi's form was barely visible under the shadows of one of the buildings. Couldn't have said it better myself. You've come a long way, Sasuke. The Uchiha was silent for a moment before nodding his head and disappearing in a burst of speed. Kakashi stared at the boy's previous spot before glancing up towards Naruto's position. While Sasuke had given the boy a clearer perspective and philosophical view, Kakashi would still offer his own advice. The lanky Jonin hopped up towards Naruto's position, plopping himself down beside his student and speaking. Yo. And they would talk for the next several hours, bonding and speaking about the subjects they failed to tackle during their time as shinobi. It was therapy for Kakashi and soothing for Naruto. This is troubling, Sirzex. A handsome, green-haired man stated quietly. The Shinto pantheon seems to be expanding. The information from your younger sister and Seraphals is also worrying. The man named Sirzex rubbed his chin as he stared at nothing in particular. Seated around him were the other three Satans that ruled over the devil faction in the underworld, he himself being the current, Lucifer. Their movement seems to be aggressive but, 
His blue-green eyes narrowed for a moment before shifting towards the current leviathan, Seraphal. Your sister informed you that this, Sasuke, individual seemed to radiate an almost divine aura. The ebony-haired woman, who resembled a child with disproportionate breasts, replied in an uncharacteristically serious manner. Sona Tan compared his presence to you, Sirzex. She even believes he might be above you. A yawn escaped through the lips of one of the men, this particular man being bald with a goatee. If this information wasn't so important, I'd be taking a nap. Quit your antics Falbium, the green-haired Satan replied with a roll of the eyes. This is incredibly serious. One false move could result in a war. While the information we have isn't necessarily concrete, we cannot afford to tread in water that may or may not be deep. Especially on Shinto territory, the yokai would never willingly traverse into the underworld. I don't fancy an all-out war with the Shinto gods let alone an unknown variable like this Sasuke individual. Silence met Ajuka's words, a tenseness permeated the air after his statement and each Satan certainly agreed with their fellow Satan's words. Have you managed to secure an audience with any of the yokai faction leader Seraphal? Sirzek's question curiously, cutting through the tension easily. The usually peppy woman deflated at her fellow Satan's words. The only response I've been given was from West Yokai faction's leader, Yusaka. She agreed to a meeting but on her own terms. Understandable but. Feisty woman that won. Falbium commented offhandedly. Our informants have been rather, lacking in the information department. The main cities of the Yokai faction leaders have upped their security. Getting information is like pulling teeth with a your fingers. The terms. Ajuka questioned with a raised eyebrow. At his question Seraphal grimaced heavily. Takamagahara. The remaining Satans all shared a similar grimace to Seraphal. Takamagahara was the abode of the heavenly gods in the Shinto pantheon. Those like Amaterasu, the Koto Amatsukami, and various other powerful deities belonging to the pantheon called Takamagahara their home. That is, troublesome. Sirzex responded quietly. Will she accept no other alternatives? None. Seraphal responded immediately. However, Yusaka has recently sent a delegate to handle affairs between the yokai and devils. The delegate will be stationed in Kuo and will operate and watch over the city. Sirzex sighed quietly, rubbing his forehead to alleviate the compounding stress on his mind. My wife has also informed me that the delegate might have been injured and or attacked when she arrived in Kuo. What? Ajuka exclaimed in shock. Who and how? This wasn't good. The consequences from this could immediately ignite a conflict between the Shinto pantheon and the devils. Sirzex sighed heavily, once more rubbing his face. I haven't gotten all the details but rest assured that Rias and Sona were not the cause. I will find out more soon. This incident seemed to occur just last night. A rogue fallen angel seemed to have infiltrated Kuo and this rogue eliminated an innocent human. This is just one headache after another. Falbium groaned. What are we to do? For now, we have to wait and see until the delegate meets with Sona and Rias. If we move now, it'll be viewed as aggressive. We're already treading thin ice as we speak. We must move with caution. Sirzex released a heavy sigh before turning towards Seraphal and continuing. In the meantime, accept the invitation from Yusaka. We can discuss further afterwards. The childlike Satan nodded her head. Hi. Meeting adjourned. Yusaka gently stroked her daughter's hair, holding the girl close to her. Kunu's breathing was soft as the girl unconsciously snuggled deeper into the embrace of her mother. As Yusaka continued her gentle ministrations she couldn't help but feel guilty as she gently stroked her daughter's hair. She knew it was irrational but she felt like a failure as a mother. What little free time she had during her day was devoted to her daughter but it felt like it was never enough. Some days they'd barely even have the time to share breakfast with one another. It gnawed at her both physically and mentally. There were some days where she absolutely loathed her position as one of the yokai faction leaders. Only because it prevented her from enjoying her time with her daughter. It was bad enough that Kunu's father, and Yusaka absolutely despised using that word to describe Kunu's sperm donor, had left of his own accord but to never at least make an effort to get to know his flesh and blood. It infuriated the woman. Yusaka may not be the perfect mother but she made time for her daughter and put the girl's needs above her own. It was incredibly difficult to juggle her time as a leader and a mother but damn it if she didn't try. I'm so sorry, Kuno-chan. I'm trying. I really am. A lone tear slid down her cheek as she caressed her daughter fiercely. Please don't be angry with me. Had she lost her daughter today? The woman shook her head furiously. No no no. Bad thoughts. Dark ones. I doubt Kuno-chan would be angry with you. Yusaka's eyes widened at the voice, head snapping up to come face to face with Naruto. She hadn't even heard him come in. 
The Kayubi sniffled quietly before quickly wiping the tears from her eyes. I didn't hear you come in Naruto-kun. She sniffled once more before laughing in a self-deprecating manner. Kami, I must look like a mess. Forgive me. A gentle smile formed on Naruto's face as he took a seat on the woman's bed. You have nothing to apologize for, Yusaka-chan. His left hand slowly descended upon Kunu's head, gently stroking the little Kayubi's hair. Do you want to talk about it? Yusaka was silent as she watched the teen show gentle care to her daughter. No, at least not right now, if that's okay with you. Naruto glanced towards the woman as he replied. Of course, whenever you're ready. The Kayubi wiped her face one last time before speaking. And you, how are you doing? Kakashi-san informed me that you've never spilt blood. Naruto briefly paused his ministrations before sighing quietly. Uh, I'm doing good. Sasuke and I had a talk and he uh, gave me a new perspective. Also had a talk with Kakashi about other things. And I think I'm gonna be okay. That's good to hear. Her left hand descended upon Naruto's thigh and she relished in the way he briefly tensed. So, care to spend the night? A dash of red painted Naruto's face for a moment before he coughed awkwardly. Air. Well, I uh, I wouldn't be opposed to, to that. His off hand came to rub at the back of his neck as he continued. Just uh, you know, I've never really done something like this. Yusaka giggled quietly as she stroked the boy's thigh. Teasing the boy was so much fun. I'm sure Kuno-chan would love to wake up to her father, wouldn't you agree? Naruto proceeded to mutter and trip over his words of the woman's words, still not used to such open displays of affection and teasing. Come, Yusaka playfully patted the spot on the opposite side of Kunu's BM sleeping form. Lay with us, and lay with them he did. To be continued.